the story first greets us with a bright and shiny chandelier hanging in a luxurious room. Then the man sitting under this chandelier, whose story we will be watching, is brought to our attention. He is introduced to us as the unworthy son of an honorable family of nobles, who dominated the academy like a king, and who seems to have been reading something. We learn that he has been accused of using profanity, illegally interfering with the results of an exam, and disregarding favorability, and besmirching the family name. All of these rather weighty accusations added up to a coherent picture that he would be removed from the family register book. A bewildered Ed Loss Taylor looked at all this with a feeling as if the god of fate was laughing at him. After a while, he is thrown out into the street, along with all his possessions. At that moment, the thought flashed through his mind that Ed Loss Taylor's life was over. The scene changes, and we see the dormitory building from which Ed has just been thrown out. We hear a voice wondering if this is Ed Loss Taylor. A second voice immediately tells him to turn away, for he may see them. The first guy says there's no point in tiptoeing in front of him anymore. He's obviously been abandoned by his family since he's been kicked out of his own dorm room. Looking obliquely at Ed, the second guy says he shouldn't have cheated on the entrance exam since they won't see each other again. The boys looked at the fallen nobleman and thought that, so be it for him. All in sweat, and with tears in his eyes, shrouded in sadness. The guy thought everything that was happening was unfair, because the impudent Ed Loss Taylor that everyone was talking about was not him. It all started when he started the game. The action of this game takes place at the Sylvania Academy of Magic. Failed Swordsman of Sylvania was his favorite game. Usually in webtoon-based games, a person played as either the eldest son of a large corporation, a talented young lord of a criminal clan, or a very high-ranking hunter who went against all the usual rules. However, out of the possible options, he got a third-rate villain who was kicked out of his dormitory early in the game, the worst character at his worst period of his life. He jumped up from the bench and screamed that everything he faced was unfair, because he had always lived a humble and simple life. The shout caught the attention of several students who didn't believe a word the guy said, especially after everything he had done. He lost all enthusiasm in a flash and sat down on the bench, and the three didn't pay any attention to him. Turning in their direction, he looked at them with a sharp startled look. Then he looked at his reflection in the mirror and saw the window of fortune. The stats looked rather sad. Even the NPC farmer's stamina was two points higher than his. He attended the Faculty of Magic, his intelligence points were the worst, and his stamina was too low even for a person of noble lineage. It's not surprising. Ed Loss Taylor was a mediocre, promiscuous villain who was encountered early in the story. Our protagonist didn't remember him much, but since he was in his body, he needed to remember what had become of this character. He thought for a while and remembered. After the playthrough of the game's end credits, Ed was a beggar, looking like a silly hobo. The guy realized that such a tragic fate was quite logical. This hooligan knew nothing about the world, and he was suddenly thrown out on the street. It was lucky that he had just survived. Why him? How did he get this body? The reason is unknown, and there is no way to find out. However, our protagonist was determined to cope with all adversity, no matter what it cost him. The scene changes, and our eyes see the academy, more like a city, the territory of which was the entire island of Arkin. The scene changes again, and we hear someone's heavy breathing among the countless vegetation in the wild forest located in the northeast. Our protagonist tried to hide from the prying eyes of the students and ended up traveling for half a day. This was enough time to appreciate his sad situation. The episode where Ed is kicked out of his family occurs early in the story. Fortunately, although he has been disowned by his relatives, he has not been kicked out of Academy yet, which is extremely important. Since Sylvania Academy was a first-class institution, graduating from it was enough to ensure a secure future. And since the actions of the game took place in this very academy, our protagonist could use the information obtained during the five playthroughs. If he could just study here until the end, he could lead an amazing life at the comfortable level he left behind in the past world. His goal was to finish his studies, but the problem was its enormous cost. As far as he was concerned, this semester had already been paid for, but that chance was only for this semester. So the next semester, he had to get a scholarship. But would he be able to do that with his stats? He'd be lucky if he didn't just get expelled. The guy decided to think about payment later. The first necessity at that moment for him was food, clothing, and housing. Opening the suitcases with which he was thrown out of the dormitory, he wondered how he could manage not to look like a bum for the next week. Inside the suitcases 
were spectacular clothes, a ceremonial blade, and a shiny decorative goblet. He had enough clothes, which couldn't be said for food and lodging. Because of his reputation, the chance of him getting a job was nil, and going back to the dormitory he had been kicked out of was not an option. At least there was a creek nearby. There were ten days left before Academy started. In that time the guy decided to pump himself up to match the level of the other students. In order to obtain some tree trunks, he used the magic of the wind blade. He accomplished this task thanks to the fact that he could use spells. He became exhausted very quickly after cutting down only 15 trunks. The use of magic seemed to increase his appetite, for after a short period of time, his hunger increased many times over. He remembered his grandfather telling him as a child that in his youth, when crops were scarce, he used to eat the bark of trees in the mountains. He used an ornamental goblet in his suitcase as a kind of pot for cooking tree bark. In his difficult situation, anything that could be eaten would do. The cooked tree bark was a little softer, and if you didn't look closely, it remotely resembled a chicken breast. The boy brought the tree bark to his mouth very slowly, as he still felt a slight sense of uncertainty about his choice of sustenance. There was nothing to do. So he began to chew the tree bark slowly, hoping to satisfy his hunger, very quickly. He felt the nasty taste of tree bark, and his hope of somehow getting enough to eat it was shattered in an instant. It had been three days since the boy had been stranded in this forest. He had hoped that his grandfather's stories would help him in his difficult survival, but it turned out to be the opposite. After a day of starvation and two days of nausea, he realized one thing. From the trunks of the trees he had cut down earlier, he needed to build a dwelling. The first thing the guy did was set up the framework that would support the entire structure. It was much more difficult than originally imagined. There were only two arms and four supports. He was unable to hold on to the tree trunks and collapsed to the ground. But the fire in his eyes made him get up. He promised himself that he would by all means overcome all the difficulties in his way. While the supports miraculously held in place, our protagonist pulled them together so that the structure would not collapse on his back again. The foundation for the future house in the forest was ready, but this task alone took a lot of his energy, and there was still a lot to do. Sleeping on the bare ground was not an option for him, so he had to use all the clothes he had in his suitcases. The night passed, and the sun rose from behind the horizon. It was the fourth day of his stay in this forest, and he finally managed to finish the shelter. A lot of work had been done, he was very tired, covered with sweat, and something caught his attention. A notice of a new completed project appeared before his eyes. The difficulty of creating anything here was measured in stars, and the difficulty of creating a simple wooden shelter was half a star. Then, he saw the information on vital skills. His rank was novice craftsman, there was no specialization. Craftsmanship was level 4, construction and gathering was level 1. Our protagonist was surprised that there was a crafting system. Ed was a nobleman, and since he lived in luxury, he didn't know that hands were better than magic. His hunger continued to grow, and his stomach rumbled louder, and in such a situation, the fourth level of skill would be very useful to him. Taking a sharpened branch, a ceremonial blade, and a small piece of rope, he joined them together, and created a simple harpoon suitable for catching fish or hunting not particularly strong beasts. The tree bark was no longer good for food. It was time to get some real food that would satisfy the raging hunger. After two days with an empty stomach and exhausting physical labor, he should have had no strength left to even move, but hopelessness helped him move on. All our protagonist wanted at that moment was fresh meat, and by harpooning the creek a few times, he managed to get a couple of small fish. He immediately used ignition magic to cook the food he had just caught. The two fish were frying and were gradually getting crispy, and juice started oozing out of their bodies, the smell of which was spreading around. There was still a week left until the start of Academy. The guy thought to himself that if he just kept at it, he would be able to hold out and the subsequent problems at the Academy wouldn't cause much trouble. At the moment when our protagonist was about to savor the fried fish, we hear someone's female voice addressing him. He was surprised by the presence of this girl, because feeling monstrous hunger, he did not continue eating but turned his attention to her. He was so busy surviving that he forgot something important. Of all the main characters in this game, he least expected to stumble upon her. The scene changes, and we're transported to Ed Losteler's memories. In these memories, we see the same girl our protagonist met. Princess Fiona was the one who got Ed Lostaler kicked out of the dorm. But before we can understand the entire integrity of the plot of this story, we need to go back to the not-too-distant past. 
Ed Loss Taylor is a villain who appears at the beginning of the game. Using his status as a nobleman, he beats up McLaurin's childhood friend, for which he gets what he deserves. But Ed didn't stop there, and his vengeful nature pushed him to try to fabricate McLaurin's work at the entrance exam to Sylvania Academy. At the very moment when he was trying to take revenge on his then enemy, he was caught attempting to commit the crime by a girl who had come to collect the exam papers. This was Fiona Elias Clowell, the third princess of the Clowell Empire. Her special magic was clairvoyance, by which the target was examined for lies and conspiracy. Shortly after attempting to commit the crime, Ed Loss Taylor came crying to all the students, apologizing with clenched teeth. Princess Fiona exposed his dastardly intentions, whereupon he was kicked out of the dormitory in disgrace. Everyone in the academy must hate him. We now return to our main character who met Fiona. She leaned over to him and asked in a loud voice what he was doing here. The protagonist got nervous and said that he was still a student. Even though he had been kicked out of his dormitory, Princess Fiona sighed and said she would be brief. She started yelling loudly for the protagonist to get out of here. She couldn't just watch the rascal walk around the academy. Fiona intended to talk to the academic department and personally demand Ed Loss Taylor's expulsion. As Princess Fiona continued to yell at the protagonist, the fish gradually burned. After three days of grueling starvation, even such a simple meal was comparable to a treasure to him. The food was burning, he didn't like it. But there was a more important problem. As the princess continued her monologue, he thought to himself that the princess had said she would be brief, although it was the opposite. In any case, Princess Fiona had enough power to get him expelled from the academy. The protagonist waited until Princess Fiona finished speaking, and then slowly began to approach her, saying that the sun would be setting soon. He then asked, Aren't members of the ruling family usually accompanied by heavily armed guards? With an angry look on his face, he tells her that it was hard to imagine the garden princess going into the secluded forest alone. Princess Fiona adopts a defensive stance and tells the protagonist that he shouldn't try to intimidate her. Had lost Taylor's intentions, however, were quite different. He got down on one knee and put his hand on his heart and said that he was just trying to thank her. Fiona activated her clairvoyance to check the veracity of the protagonist's words. To her surprise, the magic of clairvoyance did not detect any lies in Ed Loss Taylor's words. Every word he said was true. The princess was very surprised at this. Though it was hard to believe, everything our protagonist said was true. The surprise of the princess is understandable, because the Loss Taylor family is famous and influential, and taking advantage of their position, they exploited many civilians in monstrous experiments in order to find a way to obtain eternal life. This is why, as the story goes, the McLaurins will feel that this family should be destroyed. Some will be put behind bars. Some will be executed. But our protagonist was banished from this family. And although he was cold, and the feeling of hunger was increasing with every moment, it was better than death. Unfortunately, however, he did not manage to save the fish, and it was burned, turning into a piece of meat unfit for consumption. In the long run, it was much better for him to change Fiona's mind without lying. Otherwise, he would be eliminated. Though no, the game would simply end. And what would then become of him was left to wonder. Judging from the time that had passed since Ed had been evicted, there was still about a week before the academy started. It was also a question as to why the princess was able to come here. He rose from his knee and said that if she came here in plain clothes and unaccompanied, then she was finishing taking the evaluation test. The assessment test was an assignment from Professor Glast to determine the grade. The point of the assignment was to find hidden magic beads in the forest. Every student knew that Professor Glast's test was very severe. The protagonist tells the princess that she, as a person of noble blood, is of course aiming to get into the best A class. Fiona, thinking that he is trying to butter her up, says that she is not mistaken and that she should ask him to be expelled from the academy immediately. However, he then said something to her that instantly made the confident expression disappear from her face. He leaned over to her and told her that without his help, she would never be able to get into a better class. If he was lying, she could expel him from the academy. She had enough power to do that. Fiona decided not to take any hasty action and listened to our protagonist. He told her to head towards the lake in the southeast of the forest. There was a small green island in that area, and in the center of it was a huge tree called Marilda's Guardian Tree. There she was to find the gift that the protagonist had left her. When she arrived at the appointed place, she found the magic bead needed to pass the professor's test. Three days ago, 
Ed Lost Taylor was clearly a liar and a charlatan. The protagonist still remembered the sad state he was in, but now things were different. Princess Fiona stood by the majestic tree and stared at the magic bead in confusion. She found it hard to believe that Ed, who three days ago had easily been willing to cheat and trample on the fate of an amazing man, had just helped her find the item she needed. The scene changes, and a vast view of the beautiful academy comes into our view. The test to determine class was officially completed, and Glast, the academy's professor of magic, gathered all the students, telling them to get the beads they found. Several students came up to him, collecting completely different beads, and the big guy standing behind him generally brought a huge egg. Each of them had a smile on their face and a hope that they would successfully complete the exam. Professor Glast wiped the smiles off their faces in an instant, placing them in F class. As stated earlier, the test was rigorous. It was very important to write down what the examiner required of the students. It was not easy to find rounded-shaped magical objects. Only those who managed to find beads with magical power could get into the A class, and there were only three such people. The first such person was Zix, a young man with a piercing gaze. The second was Loretel, a girl with beautiful red hair. Then, the professor waved his hand and solemnly pointed to the girl who had found a bead with unusually high magical power at Marilda's guardian tree. Who could it be but Princess Fiona? The narrative of the story returns to our protagonist. All the food had been burned, and there was not even strength left to use the spear. But he was not going to give up, and using his current skills, he crafted a primitive fishing rod from a branch, a silk thread of cloth, and a fingernail instead of a hook. The durability of such a rod was very questionable, and it was impossible to tell if the fish would bite. Princess Fiona from childhood was able to distinguish between subservience and substitution of notions, from which her intuition was formed by the ability of clairvoyance. No one, even the most skillful liars, were unable to deceive her. The protagonist had no choice but to give her genuine information that could lead to a big problem. According to the plot of the story, Princess Fiona was to be dubbed the Princess of Justice. And the reason for this was to be her failure during the class determination test. Such a failure should have changed her. But the main character took a different path. A path that was not originally spelled out in the plot of the story. If now the princess, who has had a lot of influence since the beginning of the story, finds the bead and gets an A grade, the original plot will lose all meaning, and it will be impossible to predict what will happen next. Even if he manages to avoid expulsion from the academy, his information will become useless and he will be finished. The last of the top three was not Fiona, but Lucy Merrill, the girl who sat across from Fiona and snored sweetly in her sleep. There is a chance that the future might have remained the same. Fiona's shrewdness has always helped to find out the truth. Fiona, meanwhile, was still thinking about the main character. There really was a beat in that place. He hadn't lied to her. And yet it wasn't a gift. Princess Fiona initially hid her identity because she was embarrassed about how she would be treated by the public if they knew who she was. She wanted to prove herself. Of course, the bead whose location the protagonist pointed out to her would have gotten her a better score on the test, but she didn't take it. The realization that she didn't find that bead on her own made her turn around and walk away from there. The title of Princess of Justice that she was to receive in the future was not an ability or anything similar. Such an honor would be bestowed upon her for following a righteous path. The moment the protagonist said she couldn't get into a better class without his help, he threw her the bait. It didn't matter if he told the truth or lied. The princess could always find out. Ed really believed that Fiona would fail the test. She in turn was convinced that she would succeed without his help. The main character didn't lie because the princess couldn't get into the A class. There was nothing she could do about it now. The feeling of anger gradually overwhelmed her, and she decided that she would watch the protagonist. The scene changes, and we return to our protagonist. After a long time, luck finally smiled on him, and he caught a fish of huge size from the stream, which he was able to satiate himself to his heart's content. Some time passed. It was a bright and sunny day outside, and we hear someone's heavy breathing. It was our protagonist who was running hard towards the academy. He lived in a place from which he had to run away early in the morning to get to class on time. This kind of jogging made his body covered with sweat. Even that was no obstacle for him. After all, he was studying at Sylvania Academy. The scene changes, and we find ourselves in a spacious hall where a huge number of students have gathered. The opening ceremony of the new school year has begun, and before they began their studies, Food was distributed to all the students and they began their meal. 
As soon as the main character first appeared in the hall, he was immediately greeted with quiet gossip. The girl on the right wondered how this guy wasn't ashamed to show up at the ceremony after all that had happened. The main character didn't care to say the least about what was said about him. All he was absorbed in was enjoying the food. After a grueling 10-day survival in the forest, it was like a reward for him. Some students were surprised that the guy who had performed terribly during the entrance exam behaved quite calmly, and even ate culturally. Our protagonist had no ambitions. He just wanted to graduate from the academy. The girls did not focus their attention on him and continued to discuss their favorite topics. However, one girl kept thinking about our protagonist. It was all kind of strange. She could hardly believe it, but she was not left with the feeling that he had become a different person. The scene changes, and we get a wide view of the academy, and our main character says that today is his first day at the academy. A huge number of students gathered in the spacious room, and the professor, standing in front of them, felt proud that even before the new semester started, their students had become even stronger. However, our main character was not among those students who were lucky enough to be in that hall. On the first day, he was directed to the principal's office. Upon entering the office, he was greeted by a good-natured old man with a monocle over his right eye. Honestly, he didn't expect Fiona to tell the headmaster about him. But judging by the way this old man smiled during the conversation, she didn't say anything bad. Even such a seemingly simple trip to the principal's office made our protagonist quite nervous. He thought he had narrowly avoided the worst of it. He realized that he had to be as careful as possible that the story did not deviate from the original. Otherwise, the possible consequences could be very dire. The protagonist wasted no time and honed vital skills for survival. The first thing he decided to do was to start learning the skill of archery. In addition to survival skills, he also studied magic since he was studying in the relevant department. While all these thoughts were running through his mind, he watched a rabbit in the forest. Without thinking, he fired an arrow and hit the target. The bow was the best weapon that could get the most out of his skills. As he approached the rabbit and picked up its body, he thought that once he pumped up his skills and learned to create good quality arrows, he would be able to summon spirits for those arrows or draw magic formulas. In the next moment, he completely forgot about spirits, magic formulas, and all the other thoughts that were going through his head. He saw a girl with pink hair near a tree. Her name was Yannicka Filover. She was a second-year student, top of her class, and had a talent for summoning spirits. She noticed the main character approaching and asked him if he was the amazing guy Marilda was talking about. This amazing guy looked more like some kind of country hunter. A simple bow, a basket on his back, and unremarkable clothes. Jonica quickly ran up to our protagonist, calling him by name. She was a second-year student, just like our Ed. He was surprised and wondered how she was able to approach him so quickly. Jonica asked if he was surprised that she knew about him. The thing was that this forest belonged to the high-level spirit Marilda, and Janica often talked to her, so she had heard a lot about our protagonist from her. Ed asked if the forest mistress was really telling her about him. Jonica said that Marilda is quite curious and keeps an eye on everything, so it was obvious that she knows about the intruder who recently appeared in the forest. While Janica was talking about the curious spirit, our protagonist was holding the hare's body. He remembered that during his time in the forest, he had to kill a lot of creatures and cut down a lot of trees. Realizing that the forest spirit had been watching him all this time, he felt uneasy, as if reading my mind. Yannicka said that there was no need to worry about such trifles. This is the natural cycle of life for the creatures of this forest. They hunt each other for food. The protagonist scratched the back of his head and said that even a large wild wolf has a tender heart. There was an awkward pause. For some reason, the protagonist turned his head away, trying not to look at the interlocutor. A few seconds later, she laughed. She had something she wanted to show our protagonist. Jenica held out her hands, in which something brightly colored glittered. She said that, contracted him as soon as she saw him. Jonica asked if he wanted to touch it. The protagonist was in no hurry to take any action and wondered if she had made a contract with the spirit. Making friends with Janeka was not difficult. It was only necessary to choose the right moment. But for some reason, these thoughts made the protagonist feel uneasy. He told Janeka that he had no idea what she was talking about, since he couldn't see any spirit. Yannicka asked, is it really so? The protagonist answered in the affirmative. Seeing spirits was not possible for him, and he had enough to do. So he did not talk to the girl for long and left, saying that he still had to get food for the day. Only by sticking to the plot could he capitalize on his knowledge. 
All that he had undertaken earlier was to make sure that he did not deviate from the original course of the story. Jonica was a very important character with whom he was never allowed to get close to. The protagonist kept going forward. She stared intently at the trail of the guy who was leaving. She remembered very well the words that even a large wild wolf has a tender heart. Near Janica appeared Forest Spirit, whose words about the protagonist turned out to be true. Janica decided that he had indeed not seen Marilda, because only someone who really couldn't see spirits could not see such a huge wolf. The forest spirit in the guise of a wolf and Janica decided to rest in a forest clearing. Marilda lay on her stomach and Janica rested on her soft fur. She wondered if they would meet again any time soon. The scene changes, and we could see that same small island from a bird's eye view. It looked truly beautiful, a single white shining tree among the vast number of its green counterparts. Well, let us take a closer look at the route our protagonist took to reach the student's dormitory. His shelter was located almost at the very end of the island, so the distance to the destination was not close. He barely made it in time to arrive, even running out at early dawn. The road to the academy forced him to do strange things that boosted his stats. Every time he ran a marathon of sorts, someone was watching him, hidden among the trees. Getting to the academy, our protagonist began to study hard to reach the scholarship. To fill his brain with knowledge, he took books from the library and entered notes on a stone slab, using a charred stick. All these activities were watched with great interest by Janica sitting behind him. On his way home, he was washing his everyday clothes. While he was struggling to wash away the smell of sweat that had soaked into the clothes, Janica was quietly watching him. He also had to make sure there was enough wood for the fire, drinking water, and dried meat for dinner. He would jog to the academy in the morning, study hard, and wash clothes on the way home. But even in the shelter, he still had a lot of work to do, leaving only four hours of sleep. But what bothered him most was not that he was working hard. He was worried about how much longer Janika was going to secretly follow him. He turned around and signaled that there was no point in hiding. Janika, who tried to hide her presence, was surprised that the protagonist had noticed her, but as it turned out from the conversation, he had noticed her much earlier, just trying not to show it. The protagonist reminded that he was the worst trespasser in existence, and why did she keep following him? Janika said that only other people think that about him. She didn't know him well enough yet, so she didn't care about the other's opinions. The protagonist had played the game several times, so he knew Janika's character by heart. This girl looked naive and silly, but had an independent disposition. However, knowing what the future held for her, the protagonist realized it was better to just smile back, since Janika is the final boss of the first episode. She was the only character who was friendly to Ed Lostaler, despite the way he was talked about in the Academy community. He didn't want to go that far, but there didn't seem to be any options. The protagonist asked Janika if she could do him a favor, since fate had decided to bring them together. Overwhelmed with enthusiasm, Janika asked the protagonist what favor was to be done. The protagonist told Janika that his situation was very bad. It was as if there was complete chaos all around. His family had abandoned him, and there were so many problems that it was impossible to count. He asked if she would lend him money. This question brought the girl to a standstill. He promised that he would definitely pay back the debt, but this did not comfort the girl. So why was Janika so surprised by this question? She was from such a poor family that without a scholarship, she would not have had the opportunity to enter the academy and would not have been able to pass to the next course. Born on a small ranch, money was her great weakness. The stupor didn't leave the girl. She apologized to the protagonist, saying she couldn't help with the problem. However, our protagonist was not at all saddened by this. He knew what weakness to press on so that Janika herself stopped bothering him. Three days had passed since their meeting. It was a bright and sunny day outside. The protagonist was returning from hunting. He was still uncomfortable after that encounter, so he decided that he shouldn't interact with the important characters in the story. He was already in enough trouble as it was. Any wrong move could lead to total defeat. Our protagonist was about to enter the shelter when he suddenly stopped and stared at something. What he saw surprised him. In the shelter lay a girl of a degree of importance which was higher than Janica. She was the object of admiration of her classmates and even professors. The possessor of a rare talent and the strongest character of Sylvania's failed swordsman, Lucy Merrill, she began to slowly get up. And the protagonist still had no way of knowing why she was here. He also didn't understand what she needed in the mountain valley. Remembering that he needed to keep the original story alive, 
he tried to proceed with caution. Lucy said he was making so much noise it was impossible to sleep. With a stony expression on his face, the protagonist asked her if he was making noise. Wiping her sleepy face, Lucy said it wasn't him. And there was a wolf the size of a house talking to him. She pointed to a bright flash that appeared behind the protagonist's back. The uncomprehending protagonist began to slowly turn around in the direction Lucy was pointing. A spirit of the forest appeared in front of us. A spirit that had previously appeared in the story. Lucy said that this spirit asked to save Janica one day at any cost. It was all good, of course, but the protagonist saw nothing. There was no wolf nearby, only shelter, countless trees, bushes, and other creations of nature. However, Marilda's appearance meant that the protagonist would sooner or later meet Janica, which he tried his best to avoid. Hard times are coming, and besides, why is Lucy here? Lucy lay on the floor and said she would continue to sleep, which the protagonist didn't like. He wanted to kick her out of the shelter. He still couldn't understand why Lucy was sleeping. But then he remembered one important detail. Because of her small size and ability to traverse space by jumping a long distance, Lucy was compared to a wild cat. Whether it was the top of a clock tower or a rooftop, she always found a beautiful spot in the sun to take a nap. The protagonist's camp was located in the thickest part of the forest in the north of Arkin, where no one went. However, this was not a problem for Lucy. The deserted place, the cool breeze, the sound of the stream nearby, what is not an ideal place to take a nap, which Lucy did even in not particularly quiet places. After that, the protagonist had no question why she was sleeping here. He hated to admit it, but it was his own fault for choosing such a remote and quiet place. The next day came. The situation with Lucy had not changed for the better. He had to think of something to solve it. Lucy was such a strong mage that she used five or six spells each, floating in the air and still sleeping. None of this was preordained by the plot, and it was only a matter of time before it changed. Even with this problem, it was necessary to go on and get food. And to simplify the process, the protagonist created a trap. It was a rope tied to a flexible tree used to catch small animals. In order to lure these animals, a small piece of meat was used. Lucia came out of the hiding place of the main character and approached the trap, looking at it with interest. She was especially interested in the very piece of dried meat that she wanted to eat. The protagonist was against it. Lucy didn't care about that and took the piece of meat, activating a trap that never caught any prey. The protagonist realized that she would keep coming to him. Every second counted and something had to be done. Looking for a solution to the problem, the protagonist remembered about the game manuals, where he saw information about Lucy. He knew for sure that it would be impossible to defeat her in battle. But there was one way to solve the problem, with the annoying little girl. The protagonist said that on his way here, he noticed a servant girl looking for her all over the forest. Those words drove her into a stupor. She even stopped chewing the meat. Suddenly it turned out that she had one urgent matter to attend to. Without a second's hesitation, Lucy made her way out of the forest. The game manuals did not describe ways to defeat this girl. Usually, most players skip the text part at the beginning of the game, preferring to jump right into the thick of things. However, as is often the case, such small details hid very important information, remembering which our protagonist perfectly solved the problem. Lucy every day ran away from the maid, who cared for her as if she were her own mother. As soon as Lucy disappeared, the maid immediately rushed to look for her. The goal was achieved. The problem that had appeared disappeared after a while. Lucy had only been at the camp for two days, and he was comforted by the thought that this was not enough for the plot to change. But it would soon become clear that he had been soothing himself with that thought for nothing. The scene changes, and we get to the academy, specifically the joint combat training. It was a spacious room, with a battleground in the center and several floors on the sides from which the students could watch what was going on. Joint combat training is a one-on-one -on -one training fight. Considering that it was only a training session to minimize the number of fatalities, the students mostly used fake weapons. The magic students used basic elemental magic against their opponents. Students of the Faculty of Masters, in turn, were forbidden to use too strong potions and powerful rituals with spirits. The order of battles between people with different grades was determined randomly. The point was for the students of the academy to be able to fight a person from a different class and thus test their strength durability. All the important characters had to take part in this test, namely Princess Justice Fiona, the golden daughter Loretel, Zix from the Northern Plains, the spiritual mage Janika, the lazy Lucy, 
and the evil Clevius. The list was huge, and it would be a long task to enumerate everyone. The most important person in the trial remained the main character of the story, the failed swordsman Taylor. Very soon, Taylor's fight was to begin, and our protagonist awaited it with great interest. Though considering he had been through the game more than once, he knew the future results. Those first years, and Taylor would be among the winners. As our protagonist continued to watch the battle, he was suddenly approached by Janica, whom he had hoped not to meet again. It was hard to believe that she happily ran up to him after what had happened, but she seemed to have forgotten about it. Lucy was very cat-like, while Janica was definitely dog-like, all happy and smiling. Janica wanted to show the list of upcoming fights, but the protagonist turned away, saying he wasn't interested. Janica asked if he wasn't interested in who he was going to fight. This is the moment when the expression on the protagonist's face made it clear that something had gone wrong. By this point in the story, Ed Loss Taylor should have been expelled from the academy. But since our protagonist was in his body, he had to do otherwise. However, he didn't realize that he would also have to fight. But then the question is, who would be his opponent? Princess Fiona. That's who he was going to have to fight in one of his next fights. He felt slightly anxious about this. But then he heard that Lucy and Taylor had been called into the ring. Realizing that the most important character in the story was about to fight, he forgot all his worries and looked forward to the fight with great interest. Determined, Taylor shouted at the top of his voice that he would give his best. Our protagonist thought it didn't matter who he was fighting against, he had to keep an eye on Taylor. Albeit off screen, he's been playing as this character for a very long time. From defeats to inconclusive endings to triumphant victories. He's been through this huge journey as Taylor countless times. None of the paths our protagonist chose, playing as Taylor were easy. Regardless of the end result, there were always difficulties and obstacles along the way. Our protagonist decided to establish his own life now that he was in this body. But he also never stopped mentally supporting Taylor, and it looked like he was the only one to show up to the ring, because a voice on the loudspeaker was asking the others where Lucy Merrill was. The news that Taylor's opponent didn't show up to the ring made our protagonist quite nervous. After a while, he managed to find this sleepy little girl. Even during such an important event, she managed to fall asleep. It was very important to get Lucy back in the ring, because if the duel was cancelled, the consequences would be disastrous. It is in this duel that Taylor will pick up a sword for the first time, which is a very important moment in the whole story. Lucy really liked the jerky she stole from our main character's trap, because she asked him for another piece. He barely got her into the ring, saying she should forget about that damn piece of meat and have a fight. The fight was only seconds away. The best freshman in the group, Lucy Merrill, was going to fight the main character of this world, Taylor, who was born to be a swordsman. He had never held a sword in his life before, and yet he would break through Lucy's lightning-fast magic with the first swing. The spell she thought would stop the strike would be blocked. Taylor will close in on her. Lucy's surprise will cause her to be struck by lightning, a medium-level spell. She does it unknowingly and overpowers Taylor. She will be disqualified for using the wrong level of magic, and Taylor will earn the honor of being the first to defeat Lucy. This is how, according to our protagonist's memories, this battle, which has almost the most important meaning in the history of this amazing world, was supposed to unfold. There was a second left before the battle began. The bell rang signaling the beginning of Taylor's duel against Lucy. With fire in his eyes, Taylor went on the attack first. At the same instant, Lucy struck back. It was enough for Taylor to slam into the wall with such force that cracks appeared in it. Absolutely everyone watched the battle with excitement, especially our main character. Lucy continued to yawn drowsily, as if nothing had happened. The spell she had cast hadn't used up all her strength. The audience gradually began to say that Taylor didn't stand a chance. It's impossible to defeat the best student of the class. There's no point in trying to defeat such a mage. Taylor's life has always been a series of difficult challenges. He grew up in the village, but even after entering the academy, he was far behind the other students. He was essentially a failure, having not received a single decent grade since entering the academy. Before even waiting for the end of the fight, a huge number of students had already decided that Taylor had lost. However, even despite the pain he was in, Taylor stood up. Our protagonist watched the fight with a smile. Still determined, Taylor was not going to lose so easily and give up hope. Our protagonist was probably one of the few, if not the only one who supported Taylor in this difficult confrontation. He jumped and flew at Lucy with all his might. For a moment, 
Her expression was one of fear or surprise. Taylor got close to Lucy. It seemed like the battle was about to end when she got confused and used lightning. However, things turned out differently. Taylor's sword came almost close to Lucy, but she managed to stop it. It wasn't lightning, but an air barrier. Taylor tried to break through the defense. Lucy's spell seemed to radiate the spirit of the raging beast that Taylor was fighting against. Lucy flung Taylor away with a powerful wind current, sending him flying. He flew into the wall at full speed. The protagonist's heart felt like ice. The thing he was most afraid of had happened. The spell used was strong, but it was not lightning, but wind. It meant only one thing. Lucy Merrill had won. Taylor had suffered a total defeat. Our protagonist had gone his own way, but he was careful not to change the original plot. However, what happened a couple of moments ago changed everything. The most important moment of the story went on a different scenario, and what consequences could come out of it remained only to be guessed. Saddened by his defeat, Taylor bowed his head and headed for the exit. His defeat could have been a catastrophic problem, and our protagonist realized that at all costs, this guy could not be left alone. And as for the spell that Lucy used against Taylor, she was helped by the wind spirit, which protects her from sudden attacks. Such strong magic could be obtained by contracting the wind spirit, Marilda. Since Lucy was done fighting, she asked the protagonist if he would give her some jerky. He didn't even bother to listen to the request, running past at full speed and heading to where Taylor had gone. In the story, Lucy and Marilda were apart. But because the girl came to the main character's hideout in a remote part of the forest, she met Marilda and made a contract with her, becoming stronger. The next fight was to be between Ed Loss Taylor and Princess Fiona. She had a lot of questions after their last meeting and decided to discuss them with the protagonist now that she had the chance. As with Lucy, he didn't listen to her, but continued to run away. The princess was puzzled, but our protagonist didn't care. Taylor should have won, should have gained confidence by raising his sword, but lost because Ed stayed at the academy. Finally, he found a saddened Taylor among the crowd of students. He didn't know if there was any point to what he was up to, but it was better to do something than to do nothing. Our protagonist began shouting at the top of his voice to Taylor not to get discouraged after the defeat. If Taylor's spirit was broken, the chance that our protagonist would have to solve all the problems at the end of the game increased manifold. A lot of difficult things were about to happen in the academy soon, and it was necessary for Taylor to deal with these difficulties in order for the plot to stay the same. The scene changes, and Emperor Cloel, the man who first discovered Princess Fiona's innate insight, comes into our view. Such ability, however, was not bestowed upon her by higher powers. The life of a member of the ruling family was full of endless intrigue. Because of the dark abyss called High Noble Society, the princess had to develop such an ability for self-defense. That's why she was confident in the impeccable efficiency of clairvoyance. Her relatives always looked at Fiona with an ugly darkness in their eyes, and she saw right through them, all their lies. But she pretended to know nothing and just kept honing her skills. In fact, she had no choice but to gaze almost into the very depths of a person's soul. The fight between our protagonist and Princess Fiona was about to begin. He asked her to be gentle with him. She was agreeable to this option, as long as our protagonist didn't wreak havoc either. Meanwhile, there was already talk among the students about how our protagonist was trying to cheer Taylor up. Considering that they remembered him as a lying nobleman who had been disgracefully exposed, such kindness seemed very strange to them. Princess Fiona had heard the students talking, and they were partly right. Their distrust was understandable. Ed Lost Taylor used his title of nobility to embarrass Taylor's friend. And when things didn't go according to plan, he decided to frame Taylor by tampering with the test results. In short, Everyone who was in any way familiar with him knew him as a sneaky, conniving, and deceitful man. But when Fiona met him in the forest, it was as if she saw a completely different person, sincere, ready to help. This did not fit with the reputation that Ed Loss Taylor had in the student community. Was Ed Loss Taylor still the man he was considered to be by those around him? And that cry of despair was sincere. He really wanted to cheer up the losing Taylor so that he would not lose heart. The fight between our protagonist and Princess Fiona has begun. Lately, our protagonist has been behaving in such a way that he has confused Fiona completely. She needed answers and hoped the fight would shed some light on the situation. Fiona was the first to attack. A water ball appeared near her hand, the magic of which felt stronger with each passing moment. Ed Lost Taylor had both wind and fire magic, which was perfect for repelling the water spell. 
Fiona was in anticipation, wondering what our protagonist would respond to her attack. Fiona had been under a lot of stress lately, and exchanging blows was a good way to vent her anger. And as she further thought to herself, this fight would help her get our protagonist out of her head. The ball came close, but instead of repelling the attack, our protagonist simply took the blow on himself. The princess was surprised by this. She expected him to defend himself in some way, but it was the opposite. At the same second he fell to the floor. Unlike Taylor, who got up even after serious injuries, he did not do so, immediately admitting his defeat. Princess Fiona was confused by this sudden turn of events. What she was sure of was that Ed Lost Taylor had seen the trajectory of the water balloon, and he would have had the strength to repel such an attack. The students immediately began to heatedly discuss the defeat of our protagonist. Previously, they had considered Taylor a loser, but when they saw Ed Lost Taylor admit defeat without even trying to retaliate, they quickly changed their minds. The drenched protagonist stood up and bowed, paying his respects to Princess Fiona, and saying that he had learned a lot from the battle. The dazed Fiona could not understand what was wrong. Then she remembered that Ed Lost Taylor had been avoiding her as he entered the arena, never once meeting her eyes. Was he not originally interested in their fight? The fight was officially over, and the winner of this round was Princess Fiona. Our protagonist immediately rushed away running down the long corridor. Fiona was a very important character. One wrong action, and the story could change beyond recognition, so he tried to act carefully with her. Although Fiona was an important character, but far more important was the main character of the story, Taylor. The corridors of the academy were like an endless labyrinth. Our protagonist was darting from side to side, trying to figure out where Taylor could have gone. Suddenly, he heard a female voice address him. It was Fiona, who was breathing heavily and intermittently. She became furious and asked the protagonist how to understand what had happened. He said that he had no idea what she was talking about. If about the duel, then this event taught him a lot. The furious princess did not understand what this duel could teach our protagonist, because he did not even try to win. All he was interested in was how to get away quickly. She had enough problems with the class. The cunning peddler was trying to take over the school in every way she could. Professor Glast was as irritable as he was irritable and the servants she dealt with were always asking questions. All these little things, problems and confusions, were like a giant snowball, which daily fell on Princess Fiona's head, and now Ed Lost Taylor decided to complicate her already difficult life. All this time the princess tried to hide her emotions, but after the duel she could no longer hold back, and our protagonist saw how much despair had accumulated inside Fiona. He slowly approached her, gently placing his hands on her shoulders. In a calm and unhurried voice, he asked her to take a deep breath and calm down. It worked. Gradually, the princess's anger disappeared. She was ashamed that the protagonist had seen such a thing. She asked him to forget about it. Deciding to take advantage of the fact that Fiona calmed down, our protagonist decided to quietly get away. Fiona recognized that trying to guess and predict what was going on in another person's head was a bad habit. One could ask the question directly, but it wasn't easy for her to guess that considering how much gossip and intrigue she had to endure, and in her long life in the palace, she no longer felt the all-consuming anger, and so she decided to ask our protagonist directly. Fiona asked if our protagonist had tried to cut ties with the family because of her dark side by tampering with Taylor's exam results. Even without using insight, Princess Fiona was able to reason logically. Although her statement wasn't entirely accurate, but the lost Taylor family did have a dark side. However, According to history, this information will be known only in the future, and it was too early to discuss it at that moment, so our protagonist pretended that he had no idea what Fiona was talking about. The princess was sure of her words. Otherwise, why would Ed Lost Taylor try to cheer up someone whom he initially disliked and wanted to set up? The questions were very precise, and our protagonist was trying to figure out how to answer them. He said that since everyone hated him, such a kind act could at least change the opinion of those around him. Fiona didn't believe a word of it. Any fool would have realized that he was lying. Fiona's shrewdness was impossible to deceive. She realized that our protagonist was brazenly lying. If this ability had the ability to lengthen his nose for every lie, then our protagonist's nose would have reached the ceiling. Fiona knew he was lying, but she had no convincing evidence. Fiona was already almost spitting fire. Our protagonist managed to calm her down and then immediately pissed her off again. Alas, this was the way it had to be done to reduce the chances of plot changes. The princess soon calmed down, a faint vapor coming from her head, 
In any case, she had no proof, so it was decided to end the conversation at this point. Fiona told our protagonist that he could go. With a start, he looked at the door. Apparently, he had some urgent business to attend to. The protagonist went to the door, opened it, and thanked Fiona. It was the first time she had shown herself in this way. Fiona influenced the course of events from the beginning, interacting with many significant characters and events, the amount of which would have given our protagonist a headache. It was all his fault. Whether he wanted to or not, staying at the academy had changed the plot in one way or another, and to what extent was yet to be seen. Before continuing his search for Taylor, he decided to have a chat with Fiona. The way Fiona was trying to cope was respectful of our protagonist, but she looked exhausted and needed to at least relax a little. After all, it was not a palace with endless intrigues that could easily destroy a morally unprepared person. It was Sylvania Academy. All her complicated life, Fiona tried to see through people. It was understandable. The gossip in high society contributed to it, but at that moment, someone understood her for the first time. The scene changes, and we see our protagonist, who persisted in his search for Taylor. Whether he was doing it consciously or not, he lost a lot of time talking to Fiona. If Taylor falls down, his life, no, his whole world, could come to an end. He finally managed to find Taylor sitting on a bench, looking at a broken wooden sword. Finding Taylor he managed, but what to say to a man who lost a fight before he could even land a single blow? Suddenly a girl appeared between our protagonist and Taylor, who demanded that Ed Loss Taylor stay away from her friend. This girl whose eyes showed a bright green gleam was named Ayla Triss. She was one of the important characters in this story. Taylor was already having a hard time, not enough to still have Ed Loss Taylor, who had just recently tried to set him up. Suddenly, Taylor intervened in their conversation, surprised that our protagonist was still at the academy. He did not say this in a sad voice. On the contrary, full of will and eagerness. The spirit of struggle which never fails, no matter what the opponent is, no matter what the obstacles, returned to Taylor. In his eyes was plainly visible the tremendous strength of will. His spirit was unbroken, even after his defeat in the arena. And at that moment, our protagonist realized that while he and the princess were fighting, Taylor's childhood friend and ardent supporter, Ayla Triss, ran out after him immediately, without even looking back. When she found him, she began to comfort him, trying to give him the strength to accomplish new feats. And it worked. As long as the faithful Ayla is by his side, Taylor will always get back on his feet time after time. What our protagonist had in common with Taylor's character was that he had been through a lot with him. What he wanted had happened. Taylor had regained his confidence and determination to go on, even though he was defeated. And since that was the case, there was nothing left for him to do. He turned around and took a leisurely step away from Taylor and his friend. Since our protagonist thought that Taylor would save the world, he had enough to worry about to survive. That's why he was worried about him because Taylor is the protagonist of the game, who will have to do a difficult job. But now our protagonist felt relieved, not because the story, which had strayed from the original, was back on track, but because the Taylor he had played as for so long was okay. He wanted this man to keep his spirits up. That's exactly what happened. He didn't need anything else. Taylor and Ayla looked at Ed Lost Taylor walking away. Understandably so. Ed Lost Taylor had just recently tried to ruin Taylor's life by tampering with his exam results, but afterward, it was like he was a different person, trying to cheer Taylor up somehow. Our protagonist didn't care what anyone thought of him or who thought of him. Everything went the way he wanted it to. He walked to the door and opened it, stepping outside where a bright light illuminated him. A giant pillar of fire burst into the sky from the academy. And looking at it, our protagonist wondered if it was time. In the original, everyone was in the arena when the fight between Loretel and spirit mage Janika Filover took place. The plot had run its course. Our protagonist was sure that Taylor and Ayla had seen this fight. Taylor should have been watching very carefully, for soon one of the many tests for him would be the first, final boss. Loretel was a strong mage. Her barrier boasted a good defense, but even she couldn't resist the power that Yannicka possessed. Yes, she was a nice girl, but she possessed power comparable to a real monster. No wonder that according to the original plot of the game, she was soon to become the final boss. Shortly after the battle was over, a crowd of students greeted Janica with applause. The students admired not only her power, but also what a good person she was. A smile shone on Janica's face. She took all the compliments from the people around her with great joy, and it seemed that this joyful atmosphere would last for a long time. But this atmosphere was destroyed in the twinkling of an eye. 
While the students continued to shower Janica with congratulations, her attention was rivaled by her rival, whose condition was critical, one might say, on the border of life and death, Jonica. The pride of the sophomores experienced animal terror after what she had seen. The joy received after the victory evaporated without a trace. Her body trembled. Her eyes couldn't believe what she had done with her own hands. Unlike the original, Lucy defeated Taylor, and the joint combat training ended with Janica becoming the sophomore honor guard. Janica had a lot of friends, and after the joint combat training, her life was going to go at an even crazier pace. Whether it was good or bad our protagonist didn't know for sure, he tried to stick to the original plot. Something had changed, but he wasn't worried about Taylor anyway. As for Janica, he was sure he wouldn't see her again at the camp. The quiet and remote location deep in the forest away from the academy was perfect for forgetting about it. Two weeks had passed since the joint combat training. Without the protagonists and all sorts of sudden adventures, our protagonist was able to fully concentrate on his studies and survival. One of his achievements was the creation of a fishing net, which solved the issue of sustenance. During these two weeks of hard work, he pumped up his base stats. Although these stats were not bad, stats above 10 points were considered high, so it was too early to think about resting. Suddenly, we meet Janica whose face was flushed as if she had experienced the strongest sense of shame in her entire life. Once again, she was peeping at our protagonist. Just like that time, our protagonist was displeased with the sudden watcher who was secretly leaking it behind him. He did not chase her away, but invited her to the fire and asked her, what was the big deal about this place since she kept coming here? The answer was interesting enough. This place was like a secret base for her. She felt like the great adventurer when she came here but that wasn't at all what made Janica come to such a far part of the forest. She actually wanted to talk to our protagonist and ask for advice. Our protagonist was somewhat surprised by this. He understood that Janica was not the kind of person who looked at him with disdain because of his questionable reputation in student circles. But why was it him that Janica wanted to ask for advice? She wanted to do it back on the day the joint combat training session ended, but our protagonist quickly left there. Janica told him that she had injured someone during the fight. That moment when she saw her opponent, who was almost immobile because of her wounds, was very much in her mind. This memory haunted her even two weeks later, and occasionally made her shiver. Our protagonist immediately realized who it was about, and that girl as far as he knew was using a medium-level spell, which was forbidden by the rules. However, as we already know, regardless of whether she used such a spell or not, Janica was victorious. Janica tried to get rid of these memories tried to forget what had happened, but still, she was taken by guilt, and the realization that she had overdone it during the fight. All these two weeks, she had been walking around with similar thoughts, and unable to stand it, she decided to head to our protagonist. She asked him if she should apologize to her rival. Janica's friends tried to convince her not to, and she still couldn't figure out what the right decision was. Our protagonist did not have a philosophical conversation on this topic, answering as simply as possible. If Janica thinks it is necessary to apologize, then let her just do it. Sweet and playful Janica was like a jewel to everyone, so when she felt guilty or criticized herself, people tried to cheer her up. Janica knew that it was good to have companions, but it would not erase the bad things she had done. That's probably the reason she came to our protagonist. Janica said this is exactly what she expected from him. He would never just take her side. Not understanding the meaning of what Janica said, our protagonist said, that if he had offended her, he could not help her. Janneke waved her hand sloppily and said that our protagonist had misunderstood everything. She was not offended at all. While he was doing his work, Janika stared at him intently. The thought had already flashed through her mind that Ed Loss Taylor was different from what he had been last year. Janneke may have seemed silly because of her cute looks, but that wasn't the case. Her powers of observation were comparable to Princess Fiona's. She noticed that when our protagonist asked for money last time, he didn't act desperate like people in his situation. It became clear to her that this was his way of keeping her at a distance. But it did not make her feel angry. Not at all. She felt comfortable in the man's company. It was as if Ed Loss Taylor had discovered a new side. Night. Dense forest. Almost no people. The noise of small animals somewhere nearby. A truly magical atmosphere in a similarly magical world. The next day, the narration of the story continued at the academy. Our protagonist was in a great hurry to get somewhere. It was clear from the expression on his face that something was bothering him. The Failed Swordsman of Sylvania is a real masterpiece, but only a few people saw the ending. 
newcomers who counted on an easy and serene passage and ended up coming to a couple of bad endings immediately abandoned the game. For example, if a player saved a girl during a kobold attack during a class determination test, he witnessed the secret of the golden daughter. Afterward, she would send someone to kidnap Taylor, and he would be killed. Another bad ending looked like this. In the monster killing episode, if the player skipped the childhood friend Ayla and teamed up with the golden daughter, Ayla would fall off a cliff and crush to death. If the player protected the golden daughter from the fire spirit Tarkin summoned by Janika, Taylor was burned alive. And it looks like our protagonist has stumbled upon another important character in the story. He was approached by a girl with red hair, whom he tried his best to ignore with clenched teeth. The fourth heroine of the failed swordsman of Sylvania, the only daughter of business magnate Elt Kakon, a golden daughter named Loratel Kekon, appeared on his path. She was also known in student circles as the newcomer slayer. Loratel Kekon is a hidden heroine. She was peculiar. Unlike Fiona, she was treated as a villain from the very beginning, but her true face was not shown until the second half of the story. Many players entered the game hoping to have a carefree time, but when they began to realize the reality of Loratel's loneliness and suffering, they found themselves at a crossroads between her and Fiona. Loratel, when she met our protagonist, bluntly said that she wanted to buy two hours of time from him, but our protagonist did not listen and continued to walk on. He thought to himself that he must not in any case fall for her words, otherwise he would lose the initiative. Loratel ran up to our protagonist and tried in every way to persuade him to listen to her proposal, but he tried to ignore it. Realizing that such a simple conversation was not going to work, Loratel stood in his way. Lorethel said she could see how irritated he was. No wonder, under such difficult circumstances, he still somehow managed to keep studying. She had heard of his ignorance and self-centeredness, but did it really matter? Loratel got straight to the point, taking out three gold coins and offering them as an advance. She was aware that our protagonist had recently become very close to Janica. Then she asked if he could help befriend her. Three gold coins, engraved with a sailing ship, was an impressive sum. For some, it was a month's salary. Our protagonist asked, does the golden daughter make connections with the help of money? Seeing the progress of the dialogue, she slowly slipped her hand with coins into the inside of her jacket. Loratel understood one simple truth. The more people on her side, the better. And money was the universal tool to achieve that goal. She felt that she would soon be facing a battle with Princess Fiona for control of the academy. The fact that this girl was already starting to gain allies brought a smile to our protagonist's face. After thinking for a few moments, he offered to exchange handshakes. Loratel extended her hand, and a sly smile appeared on her face. To a man who had lived his entire life in affluence, falling into poverty was heartbreaking. Ed Loss Taylor, who had recently been a wealthy nobleman, had lost everything except the opportunity to study at the academy, and Loratel wanted to take advantage of the situation our protagonist was in. People who faced such hardships, the kind of opportunity that was offered to our protagonist, usually led to collapse. Such people became obsessed, eventually selling their families, their pride, and even themselves for a gold coin. People who were consumed by despair were the easiest to hunt. At least that's the way it should have been. But not in the case of our protagonist. Thoratel was counting on the fallen nobleman Ed Loss Taylor to take the coins, which just didn't happen. She looked with great interest at our protagonist, who did not act as she expected him to. Though he tried to show himself proudly in the presence of the girl, he actually clenched his teeth, for he realized that taking the coins would have been easier. But even the coins weren't worth the fear of what might happen if he got between the newcomer slayer and Janika. The latter he was trying his best to avoid, and such a decision would certainly lead to a significant change in the plot, which could not be allowed. The narration of the story continued the same night. Our protagonist's refusal of Lorethel's proposal did not offend her. Realizing the pros and cons, the benefits, and the personal interest, the ideal businessman will not miss any opportunity at which he can reach. Lorethel met with Janika for a chat. The refusal of the protagonist did not make her give up her plan. It only awakened in her an irresistible desire to make Janika one of her people. After she recovered from the battle, Loratel realized that everyone around her was talking about her using forbidden mid-level magic during their joint combat training. Loratel said that even though it had been a long time, she wanted to apologize since the occasion had come up. Janika noticed the bandages wrapped around Loratel's arm. She said that the wounds would heal soon, and she shouldn't worry too much about it. 
At the same time, she thought to herself that Janika was like the main characters of fairy tales. She's easy to manipulate if guilt is pressed upon her. Suddenly, Janika asked if she and Ed had talked things over. Loretel asked her interlocutor why she suddenly asked such a question. Janika said she asks them to hold back when it comes to personal things, but spirits like to socialize. In the same second, many spirits appeared near her, ranging from small ones to the giant she had used in the joint combat training. Loretel said that she heard most of the conversation near the northern part of the forest. She realized that Janika was not entirely simple. Janika was delighted with Loretel's eagerness to invest gold for her. But one thing she should have realized was that money can't buy sincerity. It may be possible to get an ally with it, but no one can guarantee his loyalty. Ed lost Taylor's demeanor seemed much more soulful. Being almost at the bottom, deprived of all the advantages of a nobleman, he did not sell himself and his pride for some miserable gold coins. Suddenly, Janika's face changed. She asked her interlocutor if he was showing off too much. It was the first time she had ever had a conversation with a junior student so she couldn't help herself. Janika turned around and headed for the exit. Making a contract with a high-ranking spirit was time-consuming. A lot of people were supporting her, and it gave her the drive to try harder. Does Janika resemble the main character of fairy tales? Uh, no. Does she ignore the way the real world works? Absolutely not. She was well aware of the dark side of the world, but she didn't tame her cheerfulness. Before she left the room, she apologized to Loretel for the day she had been badly hurt. She hoped that Loretel would soon recover and become stronger. Afterward, the door slammed shut and a rumbling sound echoed around the room. Loretel sighed and said that it had been difficult. But she had realized something. She had a feeling that Janica was on the edge. On the other side of the huge and massive door, Janica sat on the floor and talked about working harder. Because it's great when people expect good from her. The scene changes and the narration of the story continues in the forest, where a rope was stretched between the branches of the trees on which the laundry was hung. Nearby was Lucy, who was not satisfied with the smell of drying clothes. In her usual manner, she leaped high into the air tearing all the ropes, causing the clothes to fall to the ground. Our protagonist was distressed at having to hang up the laundry again, but suddenly, something else caught his attention. The head maid of the best hostel in Sylvania, Belmaya, was walking through the woods nearby. It was she who then kicked our protagonist out of the dormitory. He asked Belle why she was here. Belle looked around and said that she knew about our protagonist living here. Mrs. Janika had told her a lot of things, but she didn't realize it was like this. While our protagonist was slightly perplexed, Belle said that this was a good chance for him. Belle's words passed his ears as his gaze continued to squint in the other direction. Ophelis maids were an elite group of women who did all kinds of housework perfectly including cooking for the students. All this time, our protagonist was looking at a small basket that might have contained ingredients that Bell had gathered in the forest. It is impossible to get this kind of information about foraging for sustenance from books. But he didn't intend to just walk up to the maid and ask about the basket. He needed to remember if there was an event in which Bell Maya could have influenced the main plot. Bell said there was no need to address her formally. Our protagonist could speak arrogantly like when he lived in the dormitory. He said that such a thing should not be done. Such an unexpected answer surprised the maid. It is understandable to hear such a thing from a man whose arrogance was unprecedented, something surprising. Our protagonist said that the maid, who was always working hard, deserved to be treated with respect, for her work was very important. He spoke to her because he remembered that she never directly influenced the plot, and since talking to her had no significant consequences for the plot, our protagonist decided to talk about the basket he was interested in. He figured there would be no problem if they, the secondary characters, became friends. Although it came as a surprise to her, Bell still enjoyed talking about the various edible berries, mushrooms, and herbs that could be found in the forest. After the conversation, he went back to work creating a net for fish farming. The prey caught in this trap could live for a couple of days. He had enough meat and fish to eat, and the food problem was almost solved. He took an ornamental goblet, placed stones around it, and spread dry branches in a circle. Using ignition, he set the branches on fire, and the water in the goblet gradually began to heat up. He was only proficient in two basic spells, windblade and ignite, but he used them so often that he reached skill level 10 without even noticing. Soon, the herbal tea was ready. It greatly increased stamina while chopping wood or cooking. It proved one thing. Our protagonist had finished his work, and the sun had not even set over the horizon yet. 
At the very beginning of his difficult survival, he worked until late at night, and even by this time, he had not managed to complete all his tasks. But after a few weeks of living in the forest, he had not only adapted to it, but also gained new knowledge. It even amused him a little. Suddenly, our protagonist became nervous and looked up into the sky. Yes, he was surrounded by a relaxed atmosphere. Up until that moment, a bright ray appeared, rushing toward the earth at a furious speed. After the beam landed, our protagonist was thrown back by the shockwave. A cloud of dust rose into the air. He was distraught. His precious camp, over which he had labored tirelessly all this time, was destroyed. Gradually, the dust that had risen into the air began to dissipate. Soon he saw Lucy sitting in the newly formed crater at the spot where she had landed. Her breathing was ragged, and in a barely audible voice she said that she had almost died. Lucy's gaze was as if she had seen the worst fear of her life. Empty, staring into nowhere, overflowing with animal terror. Our protagonist wondered who had the power to scare the strongest mage in the world. In a trembling voice, Lucy said that she almost died at the hands of Belmaya. Our protagonist was even more perplexed, for Belmaya may be strict, but she is good. Lucy said that she had skipped class as usual, but Bell, for some unknown reason, was in a bad mood. Her fist clenched tighter than usual. Everything happened quickly and suddenly, so she moved quickly here without thinking. Lucy said it would probably hurt to get hit by Bell. Meanwhile, our protagonist exuded only anger without saying a word. He clenched his teeth with such force that they began to grind a little. Lucy, in her usual manner, asked our protagonist if there was a piece of jerky for her. In reply, he threw a stick, saying that she would get nothing because she had destroyed everything. Lucy put her hand on her head and looked slightly pitifully at our protagonist. At that moment, he wondered, why didn't the strongest mage use a protection spell? The answer turned out to be quite simple. Lucy had used up all the magic. Suddenly, an expression of either a little fear or surprise appeared on her face. He walked over to her and with a devilish grin, pressed his middle finger against her palm, gradually increasing the tension, saying it was for the house she had just destroyed. From a bird's eye view of the forest, we hear Lucy shout aloud, Ouch! Our protagonist lightly slaps her, not only for her destroyed house, but also for Mrs. Belmaya, who cares for the nimble girl like a mother. The scene changes again, and the narration of the story continues at the academy. After the incident, our protagonist realized that he needed a sturdier house, such as one made of wood. After reading books, he learned the necessary information about different materials and other things. What remained was to learn about sanding wood and making a roof. And quietly reading the books, he was interrupted by a woman's voice nearby, saying that they were closing. A girl with pink hair approached him, noticing how our protagonist was studying hard. He was so engrossed in absorbing knowledge that he didn't notice how much time had passed. The girl said it was not worth worrying about. And seeing him studying so diligently, made her motivation to follow suit even stronger. The girl's name was Elka Islan. With her sweet cat-like gaze, she seemed to be trying to get our protagonist to say his name. There was nothing to do, so he introduced himself, giving his name Ed. The expression on the girl's face changed the moment she realized who was next to her. It was a familiar reaction for our protagonist. Notoriety didn't go away so quickly, and it was no surprise, even though he had been living by his conscience lately. Suddenly. The girl said that Ed Lost Taylor is completely different from what the others describe him as. At such words, our protagonist was greatly surprised. Elka noticed how he had read all the books on the study of the elements, which she could not understand even in a couple of days. Not only that, he still managed to absorb about six technical texts while he was sitting here. All the people around them said that Ed Lost Taylor was arrogant and should not be trusted, but directly observing the one who sat and diligently studied the information, Elka realized that the rumors should not be trusted. She was sure that he is an honest man. Elka said she would be rooting for him, to which he thanked her. She wished him a good journey, and said she had to clean up and go back to the dormitory. It seemed that everything would end with Elka going about her business, and our protagonist would go to the forest and start building his house. But everything went quite differently. The floor shook with violent force, as well as all the furniture in the library. Elka turned around, a look of horror on her expression. The earthquake caused books to fall from the shelves right on top of Elka. The scene changes. We see a bright purple ray fall from the sky to the ground. The last chapter of the first episode, titled Confronting Glass Can, has begun. At 11.30 local time, thanks to Taylor and the efforts of his friends, many students have gathered in a temporary camp in front of the student center. 
Two hours have passed since the beginning of the unprecedented disaster. We hear someone's voice, who says she saw something like this in a book on spiritual magic. Huge circles in the sky, and a strange seal in the center. It is the rune of summoning a high-ranking spirit of darkness, Glaskin. We now find ourselves directly among the students gathered in the camp. Princess Fiona says, it's a bad situation. There is only one person whose level would be enough to summon so many spirits. She says that it is very likely that their enemy is the one who went into a rage over the spirit of darkness. The best sophomore student, Janika Filover. There was an oppressive silence in the air. Suddenly we hear a voice saying that it's sad, of course, but that's not the point right now. If Ayla is right, the barrier the students are hiding behind is unlikely to last long. This voice is Taylor, who also says that with Glasscan's appearance, the losses will be even greater. So they need to hurry to the student center. An Imperial Guard captain named Claire says that the people behind the barrier will get their bearings quickly. Elvira Aniston says that since this spirit of darkness, his barrier is strong. They must deal with it from the inside. Unfortunately, Director Obel was out of town. Elvira Aniston was confident that by teaming up, they would be able to defeat even a high-ranking spirit. Clevius Northendale, whose face expressed only animal terror, was against the idea. One of the voices said that they would defeat the mid-level spirits and the boss, but it didn't end there. Inside the building where Yannicka was most likely located were high-ranking spirits, two of them, the Fire Spirit Berserker, Tarkin, and the Spirit of Darkness, Belosphere, Clevius Northendale, who was one step away from losing his mind, shouted at the top of his voice that the idea was akin to suicide and he would never go there. Thoratel wondered, did Janika really send so many spirits by herself? Janika is the best student in the course, and she felt it directly during the duel two weeks ago. But is it too much for her to summon both Glaskin and the other spirits at the same time? Ayla said that most of what they see is the result of Belosphere powers. Janika may have been a gifted student with impressive stats, but she was barely average. Spirits of darkness are enemies of spirit mages who simply wouldn't have the power to control them. Demons, on the other hand, could take control of a mage who would become strangely behaved after being preyed upon. Janika, the most prominent spiritual mage in the academy, was at the absolute mercy of Belosphere. Another voice said something else was important. Jick said we had to decide what to do, and there was only one person who could do it. Princess Fiona was the perfect candidate for this. She was immediately asked, what should they do? Silence once again hung in the air. The gazes of all the students in the camp were fixed on Fiona. While everyone waited for her decision, she remembered the words of one guy. That's right. It was Ed Loss Taylor, who said that whatever burden he was carrying was not comparable to the one Fiona was carrying. The point he was trying to make was that she should relax a little. It would have been wonderful to just relax, but the situation didn't allow for that. But that didn't make Fiona despair. She answered clearly that they would be fighting in an hour. But there was one condition. Only those who had proven their abilities would go namely her, her guard Claire, and the best students from each class. She would take responsibility for the whole operation. We again hear someone's voice informing the princess how the staff members living in the teacher's area are doing. Audrey's room and the product archives were under attack. The chances of anyone from there joining them were slim to none. Fiona clutched her head, realizing the direness of the situation and that they alone would have to take action. Suddenly a girl ran up to Fiona and said that there was a student nearby. She said that she was coming from the library, where her friend, the librarian's apprentice, and a sophomore were. Fiona asked the girl what the student's name was. Elka. Elka Ilan. Hearing that name, Jix couldn't believe his ears. He ran up to the girl and asked if she had gotten the name wrong. The girl was sure of what she said. They had taken a class together for an apprentice librarian, learning how to handle grimoires. So far, the story didn't explain it, but apparently Elka meant a lot to Jix, because when he found out where she was, he immediately forgot about the original plan and turned towards the library with the intention of saving Elka, who wouldn't have the strength to defend herself. Fiona and Lorithal stood in his way, trying to calm a worried Jix. Lorithal reminded them that the library was far away from the camp and the main problem was Janica. Fiona didn't worry the girl after all. She had a sophomore with her and why shouldn't Jix rely on him? Drops of sweat ran down his face. His gaze became more anxious and his heart beat at an accelerated pace. Fiona clarified with the girl. Was she sure there was someone with Elka? The girl tried to answer, but something seemed to frighten or alarm her, preventing her from saying a word. Jix couldn't stand it any longer and ran up to the girl, 
grabbing her by the cape and shaking her like a doll. All he was interested in was the name of that mysterious sophomore with whom Elka had stayed. The girl uttered a single word, Ed. Jix was no longer alarmed. No. He was furious to learn that Ed Lost Taylor was in the library with Elka. Crying, the girl said he had been sitting up until closing time. She got tired of waiting, so she left him to Elka. Almost everyone was horrified when they found out who had stayed with Elka in the library. It was as if a demon in human form, called Ed Losteler, had appeared in front of everyone's eyes. As it was said before, a bad reputation does not go away quickly. Elka may not have cared about the rumors, but the other students associated the name with lying, greed, and anything but a good guy. Jix's teeth were already gritting from the force with which he was clenching them. Fiona and Lorethel blocked his path again, trying to calm the furious guy down. Fiona understood his fears. She herself had recently had a similar opinion of the man. But she asked Jix, why wouldn't he trust Ed Lost Taylor? These words caused those present to feel a sense of cold stupor. To trust Ed Lost Taylor was worse than death to them. They looked at Fiona with wide open and surprised eyes. At that moment, Fiona realized that the suggestion to trust Ed Lost Taylor sounded like the ravings of a madman to everyone but her. Jix froze in place, still shrouded in anger. The next instant, he jumped up almost as much as Lucy. Fiona realized that by offering to confide in Ed Lost Taylor, she had not only not smoothed the situation, but probably made the anger inside Jix even worse. The scene changes, and we see a cluster of spirits of darkness, whose gaze is fixed on their approaching prey, except that this prey has dealt with them in a flash, cutting off the head of one and slicing the others in two. Jix raced toward the library, vowing to wipe Ed Lost Taylor to powder if he dared touch a hair on Elka's head. The scene changes, and we find ourselves in the past. The expression, from dirt to princes, not even close to describing Jix's amazing life. Sitting in a thick thicket of grass, Jix watched his prey intently. The deer was going its own way, not even realizing that it had already fallen into the hands of a predator. After waiting for the right moment, Jix took out a long knife and swung it at the deer. The place we find ourselves in is the steppes in the north, the wild lands where the voice of the empire does not reach. It was a world where at the end of the day, you have to check if your head is still on your shoulders. Jix was born into a family of nomads who traveled these vast lands. Even before he came of age, he became estranged from them. He had no idea when they kicked him out, why they did it, or if he would still be able to return to his family. He learned to decapitate deer before he could read. He mastered skinning corpses faster than selling goods. Needless to say, he lived like a beast. As soon as he appeared in public, they turned their eyes upon him and discussed him vigorously. People tried to shun him because they thought he was not particularly normal. But suddenly, a girl came up to him and asked him his name. Jix introduced himself, and the girl who approached him was Elka. The way Jix looked a little amused, Elka, he reminded her of a wolf that walks on two legs. At that moment, he saw his life from the outside. His life consisted of forever wandering the vastness of the northern steppe, eating corpses on the side of the road and sleeping under the moon. He was like a wolf pup, abandoned by his pack. Jix sadly realized how lonely he was. On the day they first met, Jix suddenly felt lonely. Fortunately, Elka and her father welcomed him into their home. Trying to keep up with the fast pace of the civilized world, he had almost forgotten his wild life. The wolf pup, as if abandoned to its fate, became part of a new world for itself. But when it came to Elki's safety, Jix was ready to give in to the animal part of himself that was biding its time. Jix, like the rest of the students, had heard about Ed Lost Taylor, and he had heard far from the nicest things. When he reached the academy, he ran with mad speed toward the library. At last he reached, his gaze meeting that of our protagonist. He sat on the floor, and the first thing he asked Jix was what was he doing here? Jix ran up and grabbed him by his shirt, loudly asking where Elke was and why he was here. But he was primarily interested in where Elke was. Unlike Jix, whose voice was very annoyed, our protagonist calmly replied that she was in the reading room on the third floor. Jix immediately ran towards the reading room, without a second's hesitation. He rattled the doors open, hoping that Elka was okay. Luckily, it turned out that way. Elka was lying on the table, sleeping soundly, with someone else's jacket on her feet and not a scratch on her body. Jix breathed a sigh of relief. Ever since he'd learned that Elka had stayed in the library with Ed Lost Taylor, he hadn't been able to find peace. He thanked the Almighty Powers that Elka had remained unharmed. About Elka, he was calm. But he also picked up on one interesting detail. The bookcases were not arranged around Elka chaotically. They formed a defense. 
but even one such bookcase a grown man could lift with great difficulty. The curtains were drawn so that no spirits could look into this room. Among other things, a message had been left on the board. It was addressed to Elka and said that when she woke up, she should not panic and stay here. It also told Elka to close the door and not to provoke the spirits. She was to think about her safety and not act rashly. Everything was coming together. Bookcases arranged in a circular defense, curtains that blocked the view from the street, and a message to Elka in case she woke up. Someone went to a lot of trouble to protect this girl. Jix also noticed the blood left on the jacket, but it was clearly not Elka's. Since it wasn't her blood, and there was only one other person here besides her, there was only one option left. Ed Lost Taylor was the one who had tried to keep her safe, despite his own wounds. The jacket belonged to him. But why the hell? That was the question that arose in Jix's mind. Why would such a despicable man risk himself to protect someone else? We hear the quiet voice of our protagonist saying that he was so close. We go back three hours in time to the very beginning of this event. Elka fainted. Our protagonist managed to save her. The constant training was not in vain. What else he realized is that the plot is moving faster than expected. Going to the window and looking at the rune of summoning, he realized that soon the confrontation with Glaskin will begin. He decided to rely on Taylor and pulled back the curtains himself. Not only to keep the spirits from peeking in, but also to keep himself from looking out where the main characters abounded. From the very beginning of the adventure, he had adhered to the rule that on no account should the course of events be allowed to change. But even with this arrangement, sitting idly by was not an option. As soon as the rune appeared, our protagonist realized that soon there would be a swarm of low-ranking spirits. It was necessary to close the doors so that they did not enter and have time to somehow protect the shelter. Having finished with the defense, our protagonist decided that he would eat jerky and spend the whole night searching for information necessary to build a new house. Suddenly, he remembered an interesting detail. Janica's strength was made special by her spirit awareness and spirit connection. These characteristics were pumped through contracts with spirits. Since meeting spirits was Janika's area of expertise for our protagonist, who didn't even see them, Increasing spiritual characteristics was close to impossible. He was interrupted from his musings by a crowd of spirits. There was no point in running away from them, so there was only one option left, to fight. The speed of these creatures was crazy. But for our protagonist, who had managed to pump the characteristics of Windblade and Ignition during his long time living in the forest, even such fast spirits were not a problem. During the battle, he managed to pump Ignition to level 12, and two characteristics of spirit magic to level 7. Perhaps if he raised his level a little more, he could make contracts with spirits. But he was at his limit, a little more, and he could be in trouble. Jix returned with Elka, asking our protagonist what he was doing here. He couldn't seem to ignore him, seeing him resting all bruised up. There was no reason to lie. Our protagonist said he was practicing. For Jix, these words seemed to be absolute lies. In his opinion, only the most naive person in the world could believe them. In any case, there was no time to discuss it. Also, Jix said something that surprised our protagonist. Jix, having soberly assessed the situation, realized how much effort our protagonist had put into protecting Elka. When the time comes, he will repay the debt at any cost. Suddenly, our protagonist remembered that Elka was Jix's lover, but because she was not important to the plot, he forgot her. However, unlike Elka, this guy is Taylor's friend, whom he believed from the beginning of the story here he was already incredibly important. Therefore, this character should not have been here. Our protagonist told Jix to go back to camp, since he made sure Elka was okay. He also told Jix to help Taylor. If he did what he said, everything would be resolved. Jix clarified which one he was talking about, the Taylor who lost to Lucy in the fight. Yeah, that's the one. Jix did not understand why our protagonist had such a good opinion of him, since he had never even mentioned him in conversation before. It wasn't about good judgment, it was about compatibility. Tarkin's shell can only be pierced by cutting through the element. This was a technique Taylor had learned in the first act of scene 9. If our protagonist forced Taylor to use this technique, he would be able to win. Jix thanked for the advice he provided. He headed in the direction of the camp. Our protagonist even gave him a tutorial. So things were going to go according to the course of the story. Wait a minute. Why hasn't Jix befriended Taylor yet? The ninth scene of Act 1 was titled, End of Semester Grading. Taylor was hurt in the duel, but learned the elemental cut with which to break through the magic of Jix, who appreciated his persistence. 
The two soon became friends. However, the last scene of Act 1 took place a month earlier than in the original story. The ninth scene of Act 1 hadn't even started yet. As a result, Jix did not become friends with him, and Taylor was unable to learn the elements cut. What this meant was that no one in the attack squad could damage Tarkin. Early on, he refused to realize that the plot had gone completely down the wrong path. As much as he tried to keep the original plot, he deviated from it by staying at the academy, which led to a series of events that gradually, slowly, but affected the plot. The scene changes, and we return to the student center, where the attack squad's base was set up. Jix apologized for the delay, promising to pay for his transgression. Fiona said to forget it. Even with him, they would lose. While Jix dragged his lover out of the library, the squad made their first attempt at an attack, which was a failure. Claire said they had better take more reinforcements when they attacked again, and he promised to join them as soon as the pain in his leg subsided. Fiona told him to stay here. He couldn't even walk and take him. The problems could only be bigger. Luckily, they managed to retreat, but Claire dropped out of the squad. On top of that, Clevius, the best first-year student in the military faculty, was wounded. The situation was not good, and the princess decided that they would try to kill the spirit with the strength of the remaining people. Suddenly, our main character appeared near them and said that they didn't have time to deal with the wounded member of the team. Jix was a little surprised at his appearance. Ayla was slightly horrified and Taylor made an angry face. Like everyone else, Fiona couldn't believe her eyes. It was the last thing he wanted to do, but there was no choice. Judging by the draft stage, it would soon be over. Time was short, and our protagonist suggested splitting into two teams. Clivius took the idea decidedly not favorably. Jix calmed him down, and suggested that they first listen to what Ed Lost Taylor had to say to them. They had to get past the fire spirit Tarkin, whom Janica had summoned and deal with the spirit of darkness, Belosphir, who had subjugated her. But as we had previously learned, in the battle against Tarkhan, no one could do damage to him because of his armor. But our protagonist said that they didn't have to engage in battle against him. His idea was that the luring team would distract the fire spirit, while the subduing team would enter the training ground and subdue Yannicka. It was enough to pass through the fire spirit, and one could head directly to Yannicka. Loratel said that they had not encountered anyone like Tarkin in training, and after the first failed attempt to damage him, they were able to get away by sheer luck alone. What if the luring team failed, and the fire spirit started chasing after the pacification team? What if it destroyed the first team altogether? Then the pacification team would have to deal with two high-ranking spirits at once. This whole thing seemed too risky. Our protagonist understood Loratel's concerns. The venture was indeed risky. But as he said, Risk can be weighed when there are options. Their main goal is to defeat Janica, for then Tarkin will lose his power as well. The problem was, would anyone want to be on the luring team? It's one thing to go and try to subdue Janica, perhaps without engaging Belosphere, but it's another to be the lure for a strong spirit. A female student suggested identifying those who can't wait to say goodbye to their lives on the luring team. The first candidate for the fire spirit lure team was Taylor. He argued his candidacy by the fact that he ran fast, if anyone to choose, then definitely him. But our protagonist realized that he definitely shouldn't be on the luring team, especially not necessarily to be equally divided. Our protagonist said that he, Clevius, and Loratel, three of them, would distract Tarkin. Clevius, who was not particularly eager to participate in this battle before, took the idea with apprehension. Loratel also didn't particularly like the idea of being fire spirit bait. Clevius didn't really trust Ed Lost Taylor, and to fight against Tarkin with him was worse than death to him. Loratel, who had managed to get to know him a little better, had accepted being on the luring team. But how to defeat Tarkin? Our protagonist says there is a way to defeat the spirit. Suddenly, Princess Fiona turned to our protagonist. She still didn't understand Ed Lost Taylor's true intentions. But using the power granted to her as the third princess, she ordered the two teams to split into two. Ed lost Taylor's plan was risky, but there were no options. On her orders, Taylor, Jix, Ayla, and herself were on the team to subdue Janika. Our protagonist, Clevius, and Loratel are on the luring team. Her last request to every member of both teams was to survive at all costs. The teams then split up. The containment team headed for their target, while the luring team headed for the fire spirit Tarkin. After a while, they reached a corridor with massive marble columns on either side, and the fire spirit in the center at the far end. Thoratel asked how our main character was going to stall against this fire lizard. He said, just do what he says, 
If everything goes according to plan, they will definitely win. The luring team was rapidly approaching Tarkin. The sullen Clevius was very cowardly and lacked confidence despite his abilities. However, the best student among the freshmen of the military faculty and our protagonist is confident that this person is up to the task. Clevius realized that their commander was full of confidence, even being next to the fire spirit. But if he speaks so confidently, does that mean he really has a plan? Tarkin sensed the approaching threat. Jonica Falover was supposed to be behind that door. The princess's determination in such a difficult situation convinced Clevius to take such a risk. But that was not the only thing that gave him confidence. It betrayed him that he was not alone in going to Tarkin. The feeling of unity with the crew seemed to dispel his cowardice and insecurity. Tarkin opened his mouth with sharp fangs, and a magic orb overflowing with energy appeared beside it. Clevius was only a few steps away from the beast. Clevius turned around and asked where they should lure the spirit, as the start of the battle was only a matter of seconds. Turning around, however, he saw neither our protagonist nor Loretel. Utter bewilderment consumed his mind. Very quickly, he realized that he was alone against the monster, which meanwhile slowly and leisurely approached him. Realizing that the prey was not going anywhere, he ran as fast as he could, and Tarkin, opening his mouth even more, began to chase after his prey. The scene changes, and we see Loretel outside the building. Now and then she heard the frightened screams of Clevius. It may have been a sneaky way, but it had to be. Back when Clevius was getting close to the waking Tarkin, our protagonist stopped Loretel and told her to get out of here. They managed to bring Clevius in, and that was the end of it. Loretel asked our protagonist with a snide smile, Is he really going to sacrifice Clevius? If so, it might not be a bad idea, but it wouldn't be possible to avoid moral criticism anyway. The protagonist explained that it's not a sacrifice. Clevius may have looked cowardly, but he's the best first-year student in the military department, so he's very resilient. All the more, Loretel was entrusted with a more important task. Outside the training grounds, she was to guard the passageway for the restraint team and deal Tarkin a critical blow. Loretel, like Fiona, Janica, and Jix, who had gotten to know Ed a little better, realized that she shouldn't have jumped to conclusions about our protagonist just by listening to gossip. He also realized that all the guys doubted themselves and hesitated. But Loretel, unlike many, controlled her emotions well. Not only was she good at controlling her emotions, but also her magical power. She just needed to blow a passageway at the right moment. That's exactly what she did. There was a massive explosion. The sturdy stone wall crumbled like a house of cards. A huge hole was formed in the wall, through which even a giant could pass. The members of the restraint team who witnessed the explosion were amazed at the destructive power of Loretel's spell. Though she enjoyed the surprise of her comrades, there was no time for that. During a joint combat training session, she blew up the ceiling of Neil's pavilion with forbidden medium-rank magic. Could this be why our protagonist trusted her with this case? The passageway was opened. The restraint team rushed deep into the building. The task was over, but it didn't end there. There was still the fire spirit Tarkin from which Clevius continued to run screaming. At that moment, he hated both our protagonist and Loretel, who had abandoned him. It was necessary, and even if the plan worked and the team got through without running into Tarkin, Clevius and her would have to deal with him since he was running around. They had no choice but to fight against the fire spirit. Our protagonist had told Loretel earlier that they wouldn't be able to escape anyway, and so the only way out would be to apprehend him. Loretel didn't understand what was the point of detaining this beast if their strikes were useless because of the armor. They had already lost to it once, not to mention that no one had been able to even leave a scratch on it during the previous sortie. Our protagonist took out a small leather pouch and said that they would use this against Roach's armor. While Clevius and Loretel were outside with Tarkin, our protagonist was in a big hurry to get up the stairs. Loretel was right. Without cutting the element, None of the team could break the beast's armor. All Loretel could do was create a huge wall of ice, only delaying Tarkin for a couple of moments. For him, these obstacles were not difficult, a few blows were enough, and the ice wall was destroyed in no time. Time was disastrously short. To cope with such a strong beast, they needed great firepower. It becomes clear to us that he was all this time rushing to Lucy, who was sleeping a sound sleep in the midst of the battle. Few players attempted to fulfill all the optional conditions. The game manual stated that Lucy could be found napping on the roof of the Obel Hall. In a sleepy voice, Lucy asked what the hell was going on. He didn't understand how anyone could fall asleep in such a situation. 
To understand how this happened, let's go back to the not-too-distant past. Lucy had nowhere to sleep because our protagonist's shelter, to which she often came, was destroyed. She climbed onto the roof and slept the whole time, since the plot required her to be absent. Jonica was in bad shape, which made Belle Maya angry, so Lucy ran away using all her magic and fell asleep. Thus the game removed an overly strong character from the story. But our protagonist and everyone else was in a difficult situation, so the help of such a character was necessary, and he had a way to wake up such a sleepy girl. Jerky, juicy, tender, as if melting in the mouth like ice cream. The flavor of the jerky instantly made Lucy perk up, and she gorged herself on it as if she hadn't eaten in ages. Our protagonist took it tighter, bent his left leg and pushed back his right leg, and began to aim. Their target is a fiery lizard. In order for Lucy to reach the lizard, it was necessary to throw her a decent distance, and our protagonist wondered if he would be able to cover that distance. However, at the same moment he realized that there was nothing to worry about. He had done it often in the army. Concentrating, he threw Lucy towards the lizard. Tarkin, meanwhile, had driven Clevius and Loratel into a stalemate and was preparing to launch a powerful magical projectile with his mouth open. Lucy was rapidly approaching the fire lizard. Our protagonist watched from afar as Tarkin unleashed a magical projectile. Fortunately, he managed to throw Lucy not only at the right distance, but also at the right time. If he had done it a little earlier or a little later, everything could have gone differently. At the same moment, there was a bright flash, so bright that it seemed to color the surrounding world white. Thoratel was able to create a shield at the last moment, saving both herself and Clevius. Thoratel was able to create a shield at the last moment, saving both herself and Clevius. But all went as he wished. Tarkin is a high-ranked fire spirit with solid armor that they couldn't break through even if they attacked together. But Lucy's high-level magic was enough to crush the armor. Now they could damage him and gain many experience points when he died. Our protagonist had been through a lot, all with one goal in mind, to prevent the plot from changing course. But since he happened to be in the thick of the battle, it was time to take what he deserved, and the final blow was going to be his. The scene changes, and we see Janica's mom hugging and proud of her daughter. All the students around her said they were proud to be friends with her. Everyone said she was the sophomore hope. No one else in the joint training fights showed a decent command of ability. Well, all of this didn't make Janica's soul feel at peace. It was as if she was standing on hundreds of shards of pain and despair that pierced her soul. The scene changes. We are back in the thick of things. The restraint team has blown up the wall and snuck into the training room. Jix, Fiona, and more Elvira stood behind. In front was Taylor and his loyal friend. Jonica, seeing that so many guests had come to her, greeted them with a smile as she always did. Her entire body was shackled in chains. At last we see Belosphere in all her glory. Jonica was an absolute submission of spirit, her gaze blank and despairing, while the chains controlled her every movement. Philosphere represented the true embodiment of evil. He was several times the size of Tarkin. We return to our protagonist. The pacification team had some of the strongest students from the various faculties, so he was confident of their victory. Luckily, he also got there in time. Clevius kept trying to run away from Tarkin, while Lorethel attacked him from the side. He came up and asked where Lucy was. Lorethel said she was crouching in corners somewhere. It would have been nice if she had followed through but she probably didn't have the energy left for it. In any case, they needed to finish off the fire lizard as planned. But Loratel had used up all her magic to throw two punishing ice spears at him, and he was still on his feet, a stand however opponent. Our protagonist realized that Tarkin could not be defeated by simple attacks, even if the armor gave a gap. He needed to slit his throat, but Loratel's magic wasn't very good for that, so he volunteered to do it himself. Loratel suggested that Clevius should do it, at least he had a sword. But could he? Probably not. Our protagonist decided to take responsibility and put an end to it. So Loratel only needed to immobilize the monster. This venture, like the previous one, was risky, especially since he trusted her with his life. It all sounded a little strange, but she wasn't surprised by such things anymore. Loratel pointed out that he was saying it so simply. But in fact, he was playing the scapegoat. He explained that it wasn't a game and the price of a person's life wasn't that small. Human life is more of an investment. Loratel, as an experienced merchant, knew about such things. She was beginning to like our protagonist better than the princess, who acted like a ruler only because of her imperial lineage. He dared to trust her with his life. She was willing to risk it for him. It was time to begin. 
Clevius was already on his last breath. Too much running away from the enraged lizard. Our protagonist and he were in a desperate situation. But he understood the scared to death Clevius. It should not be forgotten that in the encounter with Tarkin, they left him alone, and he had to run away with all his legs not to become food for the fire lizard. Seeing the approaching prey, Tarkin opened his mouth and prepared to spout purple flames. Our protagonist kept pace and gathered magical power for the decisive blow. With each passing moment, the temptation to strike was greater and greater. But he realized that it was still early and he needed to get closer. Suddenly, something caught his attention. The seal in the sky turned bright red and a giant hand with clawed fingers emerged from it. Clevius trembled like an aspen leaf watching the giant hand, whose size was astounding. It was Glasscan's right hand, so Taylor's group had moved on to the last phase. Everything was going according to plan. However, the moment when the hand appeared was not quite right. It could distract Loratel from the task our protagonist entrusted to her. Distracted for a few seconds, he did not have time to notice how Tarkin came close. And the heat from his flame was growing more and more, a moment more, and he would have fired. Fortunately, Loratel used her magic in time. Even during the serious shock, she did not make a single mistake. For the first time during the whole battle, a look of terror appeared in Tarkin's eyes. Our protagonist took advantage of the second that Loratel's attack gave him. He used this spell hundreds and thousands of times. Windblade. Who would have thought that at the beginning of the adventure, when he was just mining tree trunks with this spell, would become strong enough to cut off the head of a high-ranking spirit? Finally, the first problem, Tarkin, was finished. With the experience he had gained, he had increased his connection with the spirit and his understanding of the spirit several times over. He could now make a contract with them. Their task completed, what remained was to find out how Taylor's group was doing. A huge hand with clawed fingers suspended on dozens of chains hovered over the academy from which a silhouette, painfully familiar to us, soared into the sky. Taylor headed towards Glasscan's arm. After colliding with it, a flash appeared. A moment later, the arm was adorned with dozens of cuts. A couple more moments, and Glasscan's arm exploded. Taylor had done a lot of work. He rightfully deserved to be the protagonist of this game. Both teams had worked hard, achieving success. The scene changes, and we are transported to a new day. Throughout her life, Loratel has met many people who said they risked their lives but most of them turned out to be cowards. Really? Our protagonist asks. Loratel asked. What's the matter? They had overcome a deadly crisis together, and he was so calm as if nothing had happened. They were in a friendlier atmosphere this time, after a harmoniously done job. And taking the opportunity, Loratel formally introduced herself to our protagonist again. He also greeted her with an exchange of handshakes. However, he immediately discovered the very same three gold coins in his right hand. Lorethel took him by surprise and told him that he now owed her, and there was no turning away from it. Their story certainly didn't end there. Lorethel realized that they would meet again. Their story certainly didn't end there. Lorethel realized that they would meet again. We hear footsteps approaching. It was Taylor, taking offense to our protagonist. From the looks of Taylor, his swordsman form had manifested itself. It was the same in the game, and looked cool enough. But despite that, duty is duty. Even though Ed Lost Taylor had done a mean thing to Taylor by trying to tamper with his exam results, he was grateful for everything. And Clevius, well, after being left alone against the fire lizard, it was no wonder he didn't trust him. Jix, Loratel, and Fiona, who got to know our protagonist a little better in no time, shut Clevius up. There was too much noise from one person. Fiona accepted the fact that our protagonist had done a lot for them, and using her connections, she offered to recommend him to the student council. He declined the offer, saying that Lucy was the biggest contributor, and Taylor killed Bellosphere and Glaskin. Who was worth paying attention to was them. Alvira turned her attention with a caustic smile to the fact that he was refusing to confess, that Lucy and Taylor had made a significant contribution to the final outcome of the battle was undeniable, but they were talking about what had happened beyond their contributions, or was he embarrassed? Jix reminded Alvira that our protagonist was older than her, and should be shown respect. Elvira couldn't understand why he continued to stay at his side. For a long time, he kept his distance from the main characters so as not to influence the course of events. However, when he looked at them all, he felt warmth. For so long, he watched them, and constantly solved their problems. Taylor was getting stronger with each workout, and Ayla tried to keep up. Fiona, eager to distance herself from anything related to the palace and noble society, 
accepted her destiny to become a ruler, and gradually grew up. Jix, long wandering in the northern steppes, found his place in civilization. Clevius was gaining confidence, and Elvira realized that life did not consist of mere fun and amusement. Thorothil, who had been swimming in money all her life, reconsidered her principles. Each of them is a protagonist, playing a different role. A trophy called success awaited them at the end. Knowing this, he turned his back on them. The scene changes, and we see our protagonist headed to a place that couldn't be reached by following the game plot. The scene after the story is over. The spare catwalk. This is where Lucy used to doze off during joint training sessions. No matter how much he thought about it, something seemed off to him. He felt he had to come here. In order to cover the success of the main characters, someone has to stay behind the scenes. Janika, who had played no small part in the recent event, was left behind the scenes, having lost all hope. Before heading to the backup catwalk, our protagonist asked Loretel why Janika was freaking out. She didn't have a clear answer to the question. She happened to see her room once, the day they met at night in one of the dormitory corridors. Every object there was a beautiful symbol of the sincerity and gratitude shown to her. But there was no room left on the huge desk to even open the textbook. The stickers pinned above the table pressed down on her like stone. On these small pieces of paper, people praised Janika's abilities and wished her the best. The solution was very simple. She should have removed the stickers and moved the mountain of gifts to a corner of the room. Janika's troubles grew out of her inability to do what the protagonist of the fairy tale would do. She obsessed herself with the duty of honoring all the good wishes and sincerity she received from the world. It is needless to explain how reckless this was. Belosphere, a mean and insidious spirit, took advantage of the darkness in her soul, and Janika became mad. However, why did everything happen a month early? Combat training together, the original heroes of this episode were Taylor. But since Lucy knocked him out with one punch, all the students became Yanika fans. The reason for Taylor's defeat was Marilda and Lucy's contract. She made it because Lucy often visited the north part of the forest, for that was where the perfect place to sleep was located. Quiet, peaceful, and away from prying eyes. And the one who built this place was a character who should have left at the beginning of the first act. Jonica says she's figured out why Lucy sleeps here. It's very cozy, but she didn't think our protagonist would find her so easily. The others seem to have forgotten about her amidst the chaos going on. Even though Janica was under Belosphere's control, she clearly remembered doing damage of an incredible scale in front of everyone. She thought they would start looking for her, saying, Where is Janica? Janica says she didn't expect to be found so quickly. She wanted to stay here longer. But why did she want to be alone? The answer was quite simple and sad. The sadness had consumed her so much that she was about to burst into tears. She couldn't feel calm after what had happened. Our protagonist remembered that he had been asked to save her once. Judging from the words, the she-wolf wanted to prevent Yannicka from being in such a deplorable situation. But this was impossible, for he alone knew the future, for he had passed the game more than once. Verilda must have thought that everyone was pressuring Janica, and so only a man who kept his distance from her could be a suitable support for her. In the end, Janica failed miserably. She tried to make a contract with a high-ranking spirit, but rushed through the process and fell victim to a spirit of darkness that destroyed the faculty building. She studied and practiced spells every day, until late at night, always smiling at her family, friends, and teachers who cheered her up sincerely. But despite meeting the expectations of others, alone with herself, she must have had a hard time. So far she had been excellent, and strangely enough, failure had not made her worse. He did not know how much his words would help her, but it was better to try than to just stand idly by and watch. He smiled and said that Janica had done a good job. After the crisis was resolved, the proud and main characters came on stage, and applause broke out. Behind the stage, however, it remained dark and quiet. The villain of the first act left, giving way to the protagonist. Tears filled with bitterness flowed down her cheek. Our protagonist had watched the end of the first act an infinite number of times. In a long time, he had managed to pass the game in various ways. But, finding himself in the body of a minor character, he was for the first time able to see spirits that he could only learn about from the stories of others, or books from the library. Only then did he feel that he had completely passed the first act, seeing things he had never seen in the countless times he had gone through the game. The spirit connection and spirit understanding had reached level 10. Because of this, the low-rank spirits of fire and wind became interested in our protagonist. More importantly, 
Marilda herself, a high-ranking wind spirit who once asked to save Janica, took an interest in him. The scene changes. We find ourselves in the future. Ten days have passed since the conclusion of the trial of the disciplinary committee. Janica has confessed her mistakes and said she will willingly accept punishment. However, despite the recent crisis, during the first session, all of Janika's professors and friends gave her great support. At the second session, Fiona, using her high position in society, said that she would not press charges against her for attempting to assassinate a member of the ruling family. She said that Janika was ruled by Belosphere and her actions were not intentional. Floratel took up the issue of reparations for the damage done. The Merchant Board of Elth fully reimbursed the restoration funds without asking for anything in return. They did, however, add terms to the contract to have the customs duties on the Academy's teaching supplies. As a result of all this, the withdrawal of all allowances given annually to the best students, withdrawal of all prizes and orders of glory, prohibition from entering Ophelia's pavilion during the following semester, 10 days probation and suspension for 20 days. The motion to expel Janica from the Academy was defeated. It felt as if they had finished filming a touching drama about growing up. Janika's professors and friends had achieved the desired result. Tears of joy appeared on their faces. The two girls were happy that Janika wouldn't be expelled, but noticed that her shoulders were slumped more than usual. She must have been very worried. As Janika's real friends, they weren't going to leave their friend in a sad state. It was time for them to go out. They took Janika with them and coming to a convenient place to eat, spread out on a wooden table a bunch of desserts, all sorts of goodies, and several cups of hot tea. Clara said in a quiet voice that they should not hint about what had happened to Glaskin. She asked her friend not to disturb her, not to ask her how she was feeling or anything like that. Talk only about personal matters. All that remained was to ask if Annis was ready. Yes, she was ready, just as Clara was. Not to leave their friend in such a desperate state, they decided to cheer her up but to proceed with caution. Suddenly, Janica asked why falling in love and love are different things. Clara asked Janica why all of a sudden she was talking about it. Janica replied that her friend had asked her. According to her, she had a dream. Except it wasn't her friend's dream, it was her own. She felt that she was in a green meadow, surrounded by nature. Suddenly, she heard someone's voice. It was our protagonist, riding a white horse, dressed like a prince. She happily hung on his head, an ornament tied of different flowers. They ran merrily across the green lawn like a couple in love. Janica almost said that she had been dreaming about this dream, but then she coughed and said that her friend had been dreaming about it. Clara and Annis immediately figured out the lie. She had been on probation for ten days. She never had the chance to meet her friend if she wanted to. Annis pretended not to recognize the lie and decided to find out more about what had happened in the dream. Suddenly she ran away, saying that she remembered that she had to help the professor. Janica smiled as if she was remembering the beautiful dream over and over again, and Clara was left alone. It was necessary to slowly and carefully explain everything to her so as not to hurt her extremely tender heart. Otherwise, all the students would know about the love story of Yannika Failover. Clara asked Janica, shouldn't she treat it more simply? Love and hate are rather mysterious things. Not everyone can understand their true essence. Isn't it better for Janica to be honest with her emotions? Only in front of her friends, of course, strangers shouldn't know. Janica agreed with Clara. Clara told Janica that from now on, she should be careful about touching sensitive topics. Otherwise, it would reflect badly on her friend's reputation. Janica understood. So far, they were safe from the spreading of rumors. Janica thanked her friend for her brilliant advice and left, saying she had to return to Ophelis to report on the suspension. Clara said goodbye to her friend. She had managed a difficult task, even on her own. We have watched Janica and got to know her a little better. But it's time to return to our main character. For a long time, he has been saving hard. But thanks to Fiona's petition, he has been exempted from paying for the next semester. With the accumulated gold, he bought tools to build a house. While walking through the forest, he suddenly came across Janica. He used to avoid her, but the first act where she was an important character is over. Now he wasn't afraid to make the first move and say hello. He said hello and asked if her probationary period had come to an end. A somewhat fearful Janica quickly hid behind a tree trunk upon hearing our protagonist's voice nearby. Janica remembered her friend's advice that she should be honest with her feelings. But alas, the level of difficulty of this task was too high for her. And referring to the affairs in Ophelis, Janica ran off with all her might. 
leaving our protagonist bewildered. Ed Lost Taylor manages to embarrass even the kindly Janica. In a way, it's an amazing skill. Anyway, there was plenty to do. We see the place where our protagonist was going to build a house. Day one, he chose a spacious and not very conspicuous area in the shade for building, and peacefully set to work. Day three, he began to assemble the wood. Thanks to the skillful use of the wind blade, this stage went smoothly. Day six, he stopped picking wood as the results for the semester came in. The grades for theory were quite high, and the results for practice were higher than the first year average. The strange thing was that Janica kept avoiding him. Her friends, Clara and Annis, looked at him as if they wanted to tell him that he shouldn't have caught her eye, which he hadn't planned to do. Day 18. The timber harvesting was almost complete. Had anyone managed to bring the wind blade to the same level? Not likely, but our protagonist had used it so often that he had mastered it to near perfection. Day 20. The vacation had begun. It was now possible to spend all the time on construction. When he went to check the trap, he found only Lucy sleeping peacefully. It seemed that the idea of using jerky as bait should have been abandoned. The only creature that had fallen into such a trap was Lucy. Day 27. The eldest maid, Belmaya, brought some greens and mushrooms and inquired how he was doing with Janica. In response to her saying that she must have hated him, Belmaya shook her head in bewilderment. Day 30. It had been a month since construction of the hut had begun. The single support in the center didn't help hold the walls together. He realized that it wasn't enough just to make and fit the joints to make the structure stable enough. At the bakery, he ran into Jonica again. She ran away as soon as their gazes met. Even if he manages to avoid expulsion from the academy, his information will become useless and he will be finished. To help our main character came Jix, who managed to befriend Taylor. It's back to the original. Jix asked if this side needs to be staked? No, it doesn't. There will be a chimney. Day 45. A month and a half of hard work. At last our protagonist saw the result. Bare floor, walls and no furniture. This is how one might describe a hut made of nothing but unhewn logs. But there was a roof over his head to protect him from flying insects. Our protagonist was pretty darn pleased, even though there was no furniture. It took a month and a half to create the wooden hut. The difficulty of this task was rated four stars. Now he had a house. A small one, maybe. Not perfect. Maybe, but it was definitely better than the first version of the shelter. We see Janika again, who was surreptitiously watching our protagonist standing behind the trunk of a tree. But her gaze changed, becoming more determined, as if she was ready to make her move. The walls, floor, and hearth are ready. A hedge, a shed for firewood, and a couple or three other things would be nice. Suddenly the tranquility of our protagonist was interrupted by a sudden heavy thumping from the roof. Who would have thought it? But yes, it was Lucy again, who in her usual manner returned to the shelter of our protagonist and fell asleep. But she wasn't the only guest outside the house that had been built. Janica went up and said hello to him. Well, how did she end up here? Let's go back to the not-too-distant past. Janika was sitting in one of the dormitory rooms, and Belle Maya, brushing her hair, said that the last time she was in the forest, she looked into young Mr. Ed's camp and saw something amazing. Janika asked if she happened to be talking about the cabin. True, but how did she know? She said she saw it as she passed by. Our protagonist said that he was building the hut himself, but it turned out to be more impressive and coherent than one might expect. Bel Maya remained pleasantly impressed, for she did not know he was so talented. She also had the urge to go in there, to look around and see if the house was stable. Would Bel Maya be interested in such things? Of course, because according to her, anyone seeing such a hut would be interested in who built it how they built it, and how it is furnished inside. This is perfectly expected and natural. Expected and natural? Hmm. Jonica explained that she was taking a walk, then met Marilda, and as soon as she saw the hut, she decided to look in. Then she repeated exactly what the maid had heard earlier, not forgetting to add that it was expected and natural. Jonica said that our protagonist had made a great house. He agreed. But hadn't the spirits told her that he had recently finished building it? She said that the spirits had only mentioned it in passing, saying that there was a hut being built somewhere out there, a trifle. What the spirits were more interested in was our protagonist's well-developed musculature. When he only took off his clothes, one could see relief muscles on his arms and all over his body, and expressive veins near his collarbone perfectly complemented the image. She said that with spirits, supposedly does not talk much, and was not even aware of where our protagonist lives. Suddenly, he suggested she come in and have a look around. 
The house was quite simple, made of wood, but it looked very neat and cozy. Yannicka was a little embarrassed. Well, she wasn't going to refuse the offer. While Lucy was sleeping soundly on the roof, we could hear Janika's delighted voice, wondering how our protagonist managed to build everything practically alone. It was getting towards nightfall. The ambient temperature was gradually dropping, and they lit a fire. Janika took a mug with a hot drink and said that she owed the guys a lot this time. Fiona and Loretal helped her a lot. Some friends even said they would lend her money to pay her tuition, but how to pay them back? He replied succinctly, If she can't, she doesn't need to pay it back. Debts don't have to be repaid out of principle. Janika opened her eyes wide because she had never thought of that. It's unsurprising. She doesn't realize that that incident happened because of the load of hopes others had placed on her. Despite being helped with her tuition, or even, one might say, invested, she decided to move from Ophelis with the most modern facilities to Dex's old dormitory, just to owe less. In Ophelis, each student had their own room, but in Dex the room was for eight. For Janica, being under envious stares all day would be akin to being in prison. In the end, it won't solve her underlying problems, and she won't get out of the vicious cycle. Our protagonist suggested that she drop by his place any time if she wanted to be alone. He didn't mind Janiga coming here more often. After all, she was going through a difficult period and he was willing to help her. She was a little perplexed by this kindness. For a few moments afterward, she accepted the offer. Since Ed had decided to help her, she was willing to do the same. If he got depressed or couldn't handle something alone, he could always share his problems with her. And then she would try her best to help. Our protagonist was pleased that Janica was gradually moving away from her sad condition. The next second, he gazed at the night sky. The second semester was about to begin. And with it, the second act. Associated with the second act would be the sealed grimoire of the sage. The great sage of Sylvania would make entries in this magical book. Aspect magic is a section of magic with a high level of complexity. It is known to be able to influence the principles of nature itself. This little shabby book will cause a storm that will engulf the entire academy. Loretel took an interest in the sealed grimoire. With all her merchant's natura, she sensed that this book smelled of money. At least our protagonist was not to be concerned. Hard times awaited Taylor. They had nothing to do with Ed. But the game's protagonist was going to have a hell of a hard time. The scene changes. We find ourselves in the middle of a thunderstorm. The second episode, titled The Taking of Ophelis Dormitory, has begun. The honor students at Ophelis are practically guaranteed a decent life. They are the first to choose their seats in class, are free at mealtimes, have maids, and tons of other perks. It is on this ground that the problem arose. It started raining in the southwest of the Valor District around the time everyone was returning to the academy after their vacation. The academy only provided carriages and ships to those who resided in Ophelis. After all, if they didn't make it back in time, they would be allowed to take advantage of the couple days of vacation benefit. The lower students from Dex, who had to return on foot in the rain, were afraid of being late for fear of losing their points. Restrained discontent eventually broke free in front of Ophelia's dormitory. The whole thing had been planned. The proposal related to the return of the Ophelia students was wrapped in a postal envelope and sealed with a red seal. Loretel watched the rain pouring down outside the window. It was she who had been at the root of the brewing conflict. She had contacted in advance the representative of the students below, who only cared about messing with the academy and Ophelis. The discontent was already off the charts. All they had to do was give the lower and ordinary students a simple excuse. Phelan, who was adept at provoking and manipulating others with words, pulled the trigger. All he did was to give the students a reason through a story about the clearly discriminatory treatment of the regular students who returned to the academy despite the downpour, through a proposal to make some changes at the academy, and to recognize that Ophelis students were being treated differently. The head maid of Ophelis, and part of the analysis department of the academy administration, were already on Loretel's side, ready to support her proposal fervently. In such a situation, it wouldn't even be necessary for the academy to accept it. A mere statement to the exasperated lower students that it had been taken under consideration would be enough but the conflict grew more and more heated. Ophelis is decorated with works of art, donated by nobles and wealthy families. There, even the walls, carpets, and wooden furniture were made by custom-made craftsmen. Therefore, the more damage that could be done, the better. The ideal thing to do would be to wipe out some of the Ophelis completely. 
their rampage would severely hit the Academy's finances, which had already suffered after the incident with Glaskin. Since the sealed Sage Grimoire was being negotiated at this time, the elite merchant college had a distinct advantage. The Grimoire is like the heart of Sylvania. But in times of despair, people are willing to part with their own heart. There is not a single ray of sunshine in the gloomy sky. It reminded her of the sky she had seen in the slums when she wore rags. She couldn't stop mocking herself for feeling relieved. There was too much light in this incredibly romantic land of knowledge. The picture of living in pitch darkness, completely covered in mud, is more realistic to her. The conspiracy plan on her desk is proof of that. It is the work of a girl whose life has not been one of sincerity, but one of perpetual betrayal and suspicion. Desperate attempts to survive have turned her into what she is, but the essence of her vile nature remained the same. So she desperately sought out others, like her. Even in Sylvania, which is full of light and brilliant people, there must be someone who is familiar with the vile life of a cesspit rat covered in filth. The endless search for her kind never ended, despite the hope fading in her heart. Loratel could not change her nature. Alas, she was just that. To get through the miserable reality, she always took the same approach. Loratel was a dark screen, hiding the grim reality behind the scenes. The players called her the Black Veil. Dissatisfaction among the students was growing at a rapid pace. They could no longer tolerate such treatment and demanded equality in grades. In the original story, the Ophelis capture incident was a story about Taylor stopping angry students provoked by Loratel. From the first to the fifth floor in the dorms were the middle bosses, whose purpose was to interfere with Taylor and help the disengaged students. The middle boss of the first floor was called Sackbait. He once mocked Taylor by calling him a loser, but got a beating from his friends, after which he held a grudge and was bribed by Loratel. His role was to overpower the new maid protecting the first floor. After that, open the door to the dormitory and let the students in. Seeing the door open, a crowd of students rushed to Ophelis. When the students entered the first floor, the first stage of the second act began, in which the middle boss plays a certain role. This role is to thwart the protagonist and his friends who come to stop them. Villain approached the hooded stranger, asking if he had been bribed by Loratel. Yeah, he was assigned to check the first floor and stay alert. Originally, whoever played that role was supposed to be Ed Loss Taylor. So why the hell did he become the middle boss? 